yeah. probably going live again on Twitter. There we go. There we go. Perfect. So there yeah, um, the the wage cage isn't so bad. See what they have are these little nice uh, places where you can put your feet that'll occasionally send electric shocks, and it's to <laughs> test all new employees. It's like a long... tens machine. It's like doctor. Well, you know, it, it keeps it, the blood like, flowing in the legs. It's testing the. It's like testing the hamster about learned helplessness and getting yeah, the water. There you go. And, and whether or not you want to just give up and take the periodic shock. So I mean, hey. You know, I, I think that so far, the uh, my endurance has held up. They haven't been able to break my spirit yet, despite a long ass drive today. But I won't get too much into that. Uh, how's the hockey game that I apparently interrupted today? Oh no, I'm not. I I, I should tape it. I'm not watching it. But oh, but but speaking of which, <laughs> speaking of which, I wanted to start off with this. I'm just looking at Telegram for the link. Um, where where is it? Prudentialist. I just put it up. Yeah, there you go. Okay, forward. I want everyone in the chat, and hopefully most of our audience has migrated. That's an issue. If, maybe if they want us to go back to Thursday nights. But wait, who's – does is there another stream Thursday There's night? There's Pony Express Radio on Thursday nights. Oh, yeah, that's right. Maybe we could convince them. We could convince Doug the intern to uh, to log off. But um, oh, yeah. I want everyone in the chat, okay, to please pray – that Austin Matthews gets 70 goals, gets his 70th. The first last time a hockey player got 70 goals in one game in one season was when I was born in 1992. So there you go. Press 70 in the chat for Austin Matthews. <laughs> oh boy. It's gonna be brutal, man. I, I I'm not uh I I'm not I, I don't know. I don't have a lot of high hopes this year in the playoffs, but we'll see what happens. We'll see what happens. Because they get either Florida or Boston, which is terrible. But anyways, um, yeah, so new time. This has been, you know, it's funny. I've, I've had, it's like having flashbacks. It's like having like a Vietnam. I'm going into a fugue state of uh, the BTR days when we used to stream at nighttime. So this is the first time I've actually streamed at nighttime without like recording something. So um, yeah, yeah. Oh, is Unpopular Opinion streaming right now? or they're going if, it's, if they're still live at 8 p.m. Eastern, despite starting three and a half hours ago, I don't care. Yeah, nobody, yeah, yeah. You know, we try to be charitable with uh, our competition. Just, you know, uh, but anyways, you want to do you want to do the intro, Prude? Or, uh, yeah, welcome to episode 86 of the Digital Archipelago. Debates, what are they good for? Because I've been to quite a few these days as of late. But no, it's good to see everyone tune in on a new day as people know and i announced it last week i am back in a actual physical wage cage but is with a much better job i am doing quite well for myself uh life is incredible eh, incredible eh, incredibly good and i am comfy and we are here to enjoy a comfy thursday evening or tuesday evening and we're gonna have a good time with it we got a lot of things to cover a lot of things have been uh moving and rolling and going along for this so uh i'm excited i mean it's been a fun couple of weeks uh just getting ready for this new job i'm uh happy that uh, i've spent a lot of time uh enjoying my my real world touching grass and realizing the grass is awful so hello everybody and uh yeah Gio, how have you been oh i've been i've been all right i've been better i'm kind of busy with everything um i was gonna see the woman this weekend but then weather permitted me from that so Maybe by the end of the month, but uh, no, yeah, I've been busy with everything. Tomorrow I'm double booked. I have two different things to record, which I will announce when they come out uh, with different people, uh, which is always like a, you know, a thing is you gotta be nice. Cause it's like, Oh, you know, I'll go on someone else's show. It's always nice to go on someone else's show, but it does eat into your time. Right. But it's always, yeah, it, it is nice being on other people's shows. Cause you're like, Oh cool. I can kind of like turn yeah. the brain off. Yeah. And play like the greatest hits track real quick, and then we're good to go. Because <laughs> like well, I was on, I was on yeah. Samuel Urban's show a couple of days ago. I mean, we recorded it weeks ago. But oh, yeah. I put it up on the community tab, and I was like, I can play Prude's greatest hits a little bit on on politics issues and things like that. So, which was really nice to do. Not to say that I'm phoning it in, but like sometimes you know it's nice that you're not the host right so like you don't know where the conversation's going and you're like i can i can relax a little bit well i, I like the yeah i like the jazz musician approach rather than the standard rock or metal band approach to uh where I, where like you know to me i think other people's platforms is where i can experiment and i like when people ask me more unique things rather than just um 
I mean, because the problem is inevitably you will have to track over the greatest hits and it, it does become, you're kind of pressed just depending on what people ask you. But yeah, there's room for both. I mean, I think uh, experimentation is always great. But um, yeah, so I've been busy and, uh, you know, just trying to maintain, you know, a balance between, uh, you know, lifting, content, painting. So it's just, it's, yeah, man. It's, summer is always busy for some reason. Summer for us, if you notice, like it's always uh, summers are always like a wall up when it comes to content. Cause I guess everyone, like, I guess maybe like people's people are younger that listen to us. So they're out of school or university. And I'm assuming that an uh, evening time slot, some of you are like sitting at home eating dinner. You're uh, eating your, your, um, you know, the Dino tendies with ketchup and chalky milk. So that's like, <laughs> Well, considering that our odd, well, I don't know about your demographic. No, our, no, our are like, Pe they're Peters. I, they're I was about to say, like my my YouTube audience is like more in that twenty five to thirty five time slot. So it's more like they're I drinking like Ovaltine. Think, I, I maybe they're drinking Ovaltine, or they're they're like me with. Well, the, your coworkers apparently are drinking Ovaltine. Oh, right? good lord! Yeah, I'm the youngest person in that entire building by like two and a half decades at the very least. <laughs> Um, my direct supervisor. Not even your yeah. parents' age. Your parents are Gen. No, no, no. I mean, my parent, my my parents are straight up Gen X. But no, my my oh. supervisor and coworker, they're all boomers. There are a few Gen Xers or early oh, Gen Xers man. or later boomers. But it's like I am the youngest person in this entire office by a long shot. I'm going, you know, which gives you like all these diabolical plans, right? Like, you know, who? Um, it'd be fun, but no, I I, I quite like what I do, <laughs> and it's an underappreciated kind of avenue of power yeah so it's a good did thing you, to consider and i'll write about it more in the did your parents meet at a pearl jam or creed concert my parents yeah my parents uh they met at a dating. pearl jam concert no, no my parents have been dating and had been together since high school oh man <laughs> no, sad. that's probably yeah that would have been funny though if your parents met at a pearl jam concert I don't think my mom actually likes Pearl. I think my dad does. My mom not so. <laughs> that's that's weird because Pearl Jam was like the chick band of the grunge era. You know the men the men were listening to Alice in Chains and Pantera. Well, you have to understand, like <laughs> what I grew up with was uh, a lot of sixties, uh, okay, like sort yeah. of like Beach Boys, Bop music. Oh um, man! So like it was that or whatever was on AFN on the radio because it was like the only radio station in English that you could listen to overseas, and it was just like well. Whatever they're gonna play alongside all their like really dull opsec mm. commercials that they got to play over the you know over the airwaves, that was gonna be your life. So you get used to it real quickly. So like my entire range of um, uh, like Dude, you weren't watch the global war on terror proof television while he was growing up. Absolutely, I grew up with yeah, literally G, you know global. <laughs> Global War on Terror approved TV. Although it was really funny oh. because a lot of like the opset commercials were this like one guy and he had like hamsters, cats, and dogs, and he would use them for all of his commercials. So like, you know, all the like the, the dog would be dressed in like a little army uniform that like his wife <laughs> sewed up or whatever. And like he would have the paws rip apart the documents and then like oh the cat would, the cat would sneak in like a burglar. And like put it back together, and it's like opsec properly dispose of classified documents and materials. Oh my God. And and it was great, honest to God. It was really you know it was wholesome as it could be for Holy uh, crap. for for it's opsec like, commercials. That's like such a time capsule of early two thousands American. Yeah, yeah. That oh, going to, to USO USO Toby Keith concerts. God rest his uh, God rest his soul. Oh man! But yeah, hi Mr. Patchouli. Hi chat. Um, Merely for the night owl space. <laughs> well, welcome to evening owls for people who have jobs mm. and can't stay up on a Sunday night till three a.m. in the fucking morning. Thank you, Nightmare Vision. Thank you, future Moldovan citizen. It's like it's like the show's time for zone really is in Moldova. It's fantastic. Yeah, I think you know what's funny. I think <laughs> AA he has um. He's got like a weird, like, you know, like night, like a predator type of sleeping schedule, like in the wild, like he sleeps whenever he's tired. He just doesn't care. Yeah. So like he'll start tweeting at like, like literally 3 p.m. UK time, uh, 3 a.m. And then he'll start tweeting in like in the afternoon 
uh, you know, Eastern time. So it's just like he doesn't sleep. He'll like sleep for a little bit. Yeah, no, he, he like, sleeps uh, when he's tired. And, and yeah. basically, <laughs> it, well, plus he's got like the AA Gold channel, or I think he changed it to a different name. But it, it's just basically mm. like where it'll be like whatever random shit he wants to talk about. Or sometimes he's done radio and gaming things. And so it's just like, well, when this is your full time job, then you have like a, a lodge that is your office that you're not away with your family. You can do whatever the hell you want, which I mean, oh, like, yeah. living the dream, right? For starters, uh, you just do whatever. But no, I mean, he's, I he's, he's his own thing. <laughs> he's his own beast. Well, you're not married with kids, so like, it, it's fine, right? You know. No, for true, all, true. Well, for, I mean, now, I, I for, now, for now, I don't know if you and the lady friend, you know, get it, get it going. Yeah, but for now, though, yeah, it's like it is. It's funny how he, you know, you gotta admire him. He has structured his life to still have a wife and kid, but yet. He is very much like his own guy. Oh no, I so. his work ethic is something that I do applaud because the guy is a content machine. Uh it's it's impressive. Um yes, thank you, Mr. Me Truly. Write I appreciate book. It, it took me like you know, it took me a year to write a book. It's taken me almost a few months to edit it. So it's like, <laughs> you know, well, I was gonna say, yeah, plus he's gotten two yeah. books out. I mean, I'm uh, I'm yeah. impressed. Uh that, well, that not his really academic, but like his yeah, his independent. Yeah, books, yeah. I yeah. mean his political books. I mean, I it's funny because like uh I actually own um one of his Shakespeare books. <laughs> uh, I had to read it in college. Yeah. So <laughs> Man, <laughs> who would have known? Crazy. Well, I mean, I just tells you the <laughs> age difference, but like who would have known, right? That I that mm. I would know the actual Nima Parvini and on my online career years later as a, an internet reactionary, but you know. Uh <laughs> But it's, like, I love how we said in here that Nima Pravani is actually an Italian corn star. So <laughs> it's not as <laughs> that was funny. He was replying to he was replying to somebody. He's like, actually, Nima Pravani is an Italian uh, prawn star. So <laughs> well, hey, you know, whatever mm -hmm. keeps the hope not hate people off your tracks, right? Oh my but uh, I had I had to laugh though because uh, it is always kind of funny to see where in in the, your past life, right? Like your pre online existence the things that kind of like pop up and are totally relevant years later like whether it be uh like when i was in high school um like ron paul visited like the local university where i was at Whoa! and i i went and i was like okay my, my life has been forever changed now <laughs> and then years later, they're writing like the libertarian like pipeline and things like that. And you're like, yeah, I mean, that's pretty much true. They dug up those pamphlets uh, that weren't even written by him. They're, and you're like, like oh, man, the Fed really should, you know, be redacted. You know what else should be redacted? And then you're like, and then it just all goes downhill from there. And the same way that like you're sort of like looking at what was being talked about like 10, 15 years ago. And you realize like the same thing is just like being replayed over and over. This is a great username. By Dog the way. Opsa Dog Opsa Opsa Graper. That's a great Twitter. That's name. true. There it. have been people that, for example, who have went to uh, certain rallies who have actually been doxxed because of their dogs being posted on Facebook. Yeah. So if you're concerned about Opsa, unlike me or well, you I'm know, a, I, we we show our faces like it's kind of I show game my over. cat. So yeah, it's not. No I've taken. I've tweeted pictures of my dog saying "Dog Day Afternoon." Like yeah, but you don't use the real name though. That's well. That's well, that is fair. Barrier. But I mean anyone with enough autism and real desire to get after me could easily use the whole, you know, yeah. he shall not divide us kind of tactics and easily find out where I fish from if they really wanted oh, to. Oh yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So I mean, true. you know, I, it's only a matter of time, uh, but again, eventually Hopefully, I, like the people that you work with don't really care about that stuff. They just care that you do your job and that's, you know, oh, yeah. Well, I mean, I actually took the job that I did over a different job offer because the other job that they offered me at this other company was far more public facing. Like you'd be talking to the news a lot more. And in the back of my brain was like, this is a terrible way to get docs. This is a terrible <laughs> way to get docs. It's, the it news be, puts your real name underneath. And then, yeah, yeah right. Yeah. And it would be like, you know, cause it, it was basically a glorified like PR job and, and doing a lot of community relations work and talking to the news and local government. I'm thinking to myself, I already work in what like Yarvin calls like the prog professional progressive space, uh, you know, which means like, like I work. <laughs> To, work, to some extent, I work inside the cathedral, which I do, but like mm -hmm. it'd be even worse, right? Where it's like, whoo, um, you know, that'll be that'll be the case. Um, has anyone made a, a, a at this hour steam tan joke? No, no one has internet friend. You're welcome to <laughs> academic agent streaming at this hour in locally in the UK at this time about 
what was he streaming about today? I have no. Well, today's oh, Tuesday, so it's the news. Oh yeah. Um. <laughs> about uh, whether we should side with Muslims or Jews. <laughs> yeah. Oh God. Well, that's another debate that was already happened ten years ago. I don't know why that's being. Let's not talk about. It. I, you know, just. I don't know why it's being relitigated. Both there's have very their crazy problems. people on both sides. So let's. We prefer yeah. not to talk about it in the digital archipelago. He's been talking about Iran, and he's been live for like eight hours. Well, welcome to the show. Welcome to the, the new show for the evening. The ride never ends. You want to get off Mr. Bones' wild ride? The frog says no. Yeah. Where'd Wednesdays go? You mean you mean Thursdays? You mean Thursdays? Mm. Well, Thursday disappeared. Um, Prude is back in the wage cage, and this is how it's going to be. Well, we were going to do Thursday night. It's just that, you know, uh, Pony Express. Yeah, Pony Express Radio. And they've got a, and they have shirts now with white boy summer apparel. So if you want a Pony Express Radio um, T-shirt, they've got them. So I thought it was pretty cool. Uh, but no yeah, more so smoke show. No more saying smoke show. No more salmon color. <laughs> you, you remember that the original Chet Hayes? Yeah, yeah, white yeah. boy. I'm calling for a wet boy summer. Um, yeah, there was that Eagles. like journalist that tried to write about it, and he like totally owned her on Instagram. That was funny um many many such cases there's a Um, lot of people there's a lot of people in this world who have humanities degrees who work in journalism uh that don't know what to do with themselves so they write about pop culture that's usually what it is there's a lot of people that write for for shows that that uh that basically it's it's like i said this because there was that viral clip where um what's that show with the two dogs bluey Yes, I don't know anything about it because I don't watch it. It's I'm not yeah, a parent yet. Kids show, but it's it's about like this moment where they don't decide to move out of their house or whatever. And I wrote this under scene. And the memes. father has the the really yeah. like, and, and people were saying it's a really cathartic moment. And both parents and kids are like, this is a par, you know, a step above all the other kids shows or whatever. And Courage the Cowardly would... Dog was step above all the kids shows. But anyway, so um, no, but I I wrote this under scene memes tweet about it i said that basically it's a way for terminally aging millennials to have a form of authentic catharsis or whatever or emotional appeal but because they can't really they're too ironically detached and they're too like arrested development cases to really enjoy and appreciate actual mature art and cinema therefore they have to colonize like literal children's media to do this sort of like weirdo nostalgic like emotional cushioning from what they really want to say in life, because if they were to come out with something that was, I mean, there is pieces of artwork and there is cinema that is sincere, but if you watch a lot of indie films from the early two thousands, as I do, uh, the sincerity in any film that has come out and say, especially after the 2010s, it's, it's, it's just gone. Like what was the last, like truly sincere romance film or the last truly sincere indie drama that you've seen? I'm sure they exist again. I don't want to, you know, I don't want to generalize. I don't think you want to know the last like romance film that I've. Well, Brooklyn. I have a soft. I have a soft spot in my heart for the Ethan Hawke like before Sunrise Sunset trilogy. Oh, uh, who was that with Ethan Hawke and? Uh... Um, before Sunrise. Oh man. Uh, that is with um, what's her name? Uh, Julie Depley. That was. I think that was the first one. And then, yeah, the whole trilogy is like three, yeah, the before trilogy. I mean, these are all Richard Linklater films. And mm-hmm. I'm sure if I were to rewatch them, I might have a different opinion. I just remember watching them when I was like a teenager and liking them mm-hmm. a lot and finding them to be very good. Um, but I mean, as for romance today, I don't know what was the last good romance film. I don't, I don't watch or read a lot of it to begin with. Um, <laughs> but I, and I, I think that there was this, there was this, uh, was it like Soleon or um, one of our mutuals had popped off and it made a point that uh, there's a really large generational divide between like Gen X millennials versus Zoomers where mm-hmm. there has been a significant up t- uptick amongst Gen Z that wants to believe in like true love, soulmates, the platonic ideal of a like a youthful romance, something of which of course doesn't seem to exist nowadays due to all sorts of reasons. Uh, but they believe in it, and that's their hope. That's what they're like yearning for. And he was yeah. like, he had this like little clip of some guy, you know, just like 
very directly threatening people. And it's like my thoughts to Gen X and like millennials right now. It's just like, it's over for you. You've taken this from me. We're going to kill you. And it was just like, I kind of don't blame him for the anger because they're out of all like the generational backbiting. I mean, everyone shits on the boomers, which I, to, some, to, to a large extent, yeah. qualifiable, but also I think sometimes not justified. But I, I, I thought that was interesting because I never look at it from this like romantic perspective because it's like, I have someone in my life. I'm very happy with her. Things are going great on that end and will hopefully end in the, the way I want it to. And so it's just like, I don't think about that because it's like, Oh, is that the first I, time you're announcing that publicly, Prude? Uh, no. Well, maybe. Who knows? But anyways, it doesn't matter. <laughs> that was the um, way I slipped it out. Yeah. Well, it, it really doesn't yeah. matter because eventually so she'll text you to be like, so why the well, hell did I mean, you say this on the air? But um, yeah. I, I do I do think that boomer chasing is, boomer shitting is overrated. Yes, yeah. um, in, in part, and I've well, I've I've already written about that. I'll tell people to do it. Um, chasing chased. That's interesting. I mean, that, that's actually that would be a good um, essay title. You fuckers knew this already. Oh, not fake sales. Sorry, you you guys knew this already. Yeah, Gio was late to the party, me. but he's also one of them. Um, you can join to it. Uh, but yeah, <laughs> kill yes, 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 shit. Let yes, us, yes, let us, yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, more of the soy lineal thing, because like the oh, shit, the whole Lennial's the whole one, like though. the whole That's a good one. because what I mean, it's this Rick and Morty nonsense of like, oh, love is just a chemical reaction, and you're all retarded, and I can prove it mathematically, and it's just mm -hmm. like, so we've killed any sense of wonder, yeah. society, societal expectations for what like love or romance is supposed to look like. We've killed courtship. Mm -hmm. And so all these people are living in like the fallout of the wasteland and it's like canticle for Leibowitz, right? So like they find these people, they find all this old tech from the old world before the bombs fell and they start reading it. They're like, whoa, this is how shit used to be. This is how things were before the bombs fell, before the pill, before yada, yada. And it's like, yes, it was, it was sort of like that anime. Girls or at least the very tour. least, that's what we told ourselves that it was right. Cause yeah. it was always the, the, the gritty, ugly side of reality, even in the olden days. And it's just like, so, okay, great. And so amidst, um, there you go. Uh, amidst mutual immaturity, there's so much that goes into stable relationships that wasn't just passed down from the boomers. I mean, Gen X, mm -hmm. I think, is the last generation that really gets this. Yeah. Because, I mean, as we've talked about when we covered the the Tom Hanks, Meg Ryan movies, all three of them. Sorry, Gio, but I, you forced me to watch Kink. I forced you to watch three rom-coms that I've No, they were all right. They were pretty for. good. Uh, and at the same time. Whatever happened to Meg Ryan? That's a great question. I don't know. I don't think she does anything like that. We should do um, a girls last tour episode. I, I mentioned in the content minded once, I compared it to stalker a uh, few scenes here and there, but anyways, I actually don't know girls last tour. So there you go. You'd like it. Um, I think you'd like it. I mean, I have the musical taste of an early 2000s shit lib. Like, you know, the scene <laughs> in garden state where like, um, uh, Natalie Portman puts like the headphones and the shins are playing oh. in Zach Braff's ears. I'm oh. like, yeah, I liked that. So I mean, I still, I've, I've, been to more, Leon. I've been to more Decemberists concerts than I would ever like to admit publicly. But remember when that guy owned Stephen Colbert? I'm, I remember I watched that episode way back in the day. Nick Ryan's son is in the boys. Which one? Oh, oh God. Wow. Are you guys engaging in Paw Patrol politics? No, because I've never seen Paw Patrol. We just referenced <laughs> Paw Patrol. Um, no, but anyways, you were saying about romance and, and uh, I've been listening oh, to alternative. I didn't know that she uh, was married rock. to Dennis Quaid. I didn't know that that was Meg Ryan's kid. Mm. Okay. I just knew that that was uh, Dennis Quaid's son. I didn't know that Dennis Quaid was married to Meg Ryan. It tells you how Whoa. connected we are to the, like the normie, you know, access Hollywood type. I can't believe type, Randy right? Quaid is her uh, brother-in-law, the one of the most based men in Hollywood alive. So... Remember when he flipped out? That was, and then Nuke Telly did that, uh, that edit, beware, Mr. Beware, Mr. Quaid. <laughs> that was like, that was incredible. I'm going to put the, I'm going to put the Giga Chad, the ancient Giga Chad that says, remember, beware, Mr. Quaid. <laughs> my favorite shoot. Yeah. My favorite genre of shoot gates, which is hell for reactionary. You and Dave both, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. My music taste is perpetually the two thousands with some exceptions. I mean, basically me. Put it basically this way. Me. Like like uh, that film that 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 album Loveless by uh, My Bloody Valentine like uh, that's like truly transcendental music, but a lot of Impossibles and a lot of Beyond women really love that album for some reason. But um, I've been listening to a lot of uh, uh, like alternative rock with uh, women singers lately. 
I don't know why I've gotten into like a whole of it. I think as I was watching this Vincent Gallo film from the late nineties, I had like the soundtrack to it. But anyways, Prue, finish your point about romance. Cause I also had a point about, um, Oh, I, I just liked the, the, the tweet just in the respects of this intergenerational oh. conflict. Cause I mean, how much of all of this stuff gets talked about in the context oh, of like the bombs have dropped. The world is like in this, yeah. post, and which is true, right? Like let's not kid ourselves. Like huh, Rick, the post nothing means anything. No, you're never going to be the same. And you're, gonna, uh, that was you're, you're never going to be the same. Women are awful. Men are pieces of shit. Everyone's a pig holes of holes. Everyone gets used. <laughs> and it's like, okay, great. But <laughs> can we have something better than that? And it's just, and like the Zoomers are apparently have some sort of belief in true love. You or can't romance. really. You can't. Maybe. Uh, maybe. Maybe. No, maybe. to Oops. them you can't. To like people that want to. Yeah. Yeah. But um, I gotta go check on chat now and in, in Twitter because Seb is posting in that chat, and I gotta go. He sent me a BAP tweet, and I gotta go look it up now. There was a there was a documentary from the BBC. I I was uh, watching a clip of someone posted about the um uh, the the sort of carry on from the Renaissance in terms of the work of art into the romantic and romanticism period. And, uh, Oh yeah. By the way, sneak those super chats. We forgot. About yes. By that. all means. Yeah. So, uh, but the, the presenter for the BBC was saying about how, when it comes to the sort of cycle of, of the work of art through the ages, whether it goes into a period of very high creativity, very high exuberance of energy that coalesces around certain art movements. Of course, the art movement is dead now uh, after Andy Warhol, uh, or so people say. You know, what thing? The, the one thing that carried through between periods of exuberance and creativity, then a declining period of decay, uh, well, not just decay, but a declining period of sort of like the vulgarity of people and artists that were of a lesser quality coming in after the original creators and sort of aping that style creating a weird sense of formalism around the work of art that was previous to them and entering a period of decline. We've seen the artwork decline more or less throughout all epochs. But he said the one thing that really carried through is basically this love of romance itself. That yeah. romanticism in terms of an intense desire, not just of expression, but rather a sort of the work of art being able to not express, but also to connect uh yeah smeed those super chats we oh, love God. smeed here we, we love, love smeed. smeed you know smeed uh earth rabbit atrazine groiper all, all we, you we, know. we love we, we love we love them we love our yeah we love our zoomers don't we folks um but anyways um we'll, we'll, we'll get to the donald trump thing so basically romanticism or the quality of romance if we were to say and again, a lot of people would say this from Kierkegaard to Emerson as a connection beyond the self, ultimately a connection towards the divine. But what is the divine, but rather uh, something that's deep within ourselves that is also longing for a form of communion. That is the spirit that has carried the work of art through its darkest periods. And nowadays you can see this uh, yearning for that as well, because we are in a period of intense cultural and artistic decline. But and we, there's sort of a weird imitation and sort of weird eclecticism that comes with that period of decline because people are intent to ape the sort of art forms and the sort of narratives that have come before us. I mean, Hollywood, for instance, is full of this. I mean, Hollywood, I mean, can they make anything new, originally new, 100%? Not that you should fetishize the new, but rather something that has a spirit that carries within it that isn't necessarily entirely new because all art form, all artworks are dialectical. All art forms borrow from the past but at this or what came before it but it's the way that you interpolate that form of artwork it's the way that you process it through your own sort of eye that is what they were talking about when it came to the romanticism of art of the work of art when you lack that when a culture has abandoned its capacity for romance not just romance in a romantic like filial or erotic sense although eroticism as at the base of most things. Eroticism is also at the base of politics. Shout out to Basil. Uh, but, it, you know, when you've abandoned that impulse towards the romantic as a foil for connection, then you have a very, very trying, precarious times. And that usually a lot of people will get filtered. 
as a lot of people were filtered, for example, by 19th century academicism, then what happened after? Well, you had this explosion. You had, uh, you know, you uh, abstract. You know, you had impressionism. You had the Vienna School. You had Nouveau, uh, and so people, I think, longed for something that wasn't just a pale imitation. Because truly, I mean, a lot of people beg to differ, and people know. I mean, my controversial take on people like Bouguereau, but it's like I don't really see a lot of that romanticism. I don't really see a lot of the like. I mean, even as much as I find them kitsch or whatever. Um, like, I still think that, for example, the pre-Raphaelites or people like Rossetti, people like William Waterhouse, like, there's still, like, you could tell there's a love of women, there's a love of the sensual form, the way that there was there in, for example, Gustav Klimt, the way that he painted women, or even, uh, Leighton, even though I think Leighton does venture into a lot of catch, as all of them did, right? I mean, Matthew the Stout, he's, that's his favorite movement. I, me and him, we disagree. But I do think that there still is that impulse there because it's an escape from a sort of formalism that is bred about by this very like high-minded idea of aping the past, not just aping the past, but also like aping a form of technical proficiency. And a lot of people are like that. This is what Kitsch is, by the way. Kitsch is excellence in that it's only a technical proficiency to hit those emotional markers. And what, what happens nowadays when it comes to film, when it comes to popular media, when it comes to music, although music, when you notice music is kind of dead when it comes to like youth culture, like do Zoomers like really coalesce their identities around youth culture the way that millennials or Gen Xers did? Like, I don't think so. Right? I mean, I could be wrong, right? But for example, films, the only films that people talk about are perfectly designed to capture this sort of discourse machine. The only films that are culturally relevant are the ones that have hoarded themselves out to the point where they could just go on the internet and people could talk about them forever. Like Barbie, like Oppenheimer. What was the example before Barbie that was like that? Oh, Joker. Uh, now it's, it's, uh, it's Civil War. We're going to have an episode in Civil War, Prude. So in other words, there's a process of refinement that, that captures people's attentions but it's very okay. Okay, okay. hold on. I have to interrupt. Sorry, if we're doing bro. an episode on Civil War, I'm not watching it, and I'm going to review it exactly like Zizek reviewed Matrix Resurrections. I'm not going to see it. I've only well, seen the trailers. It, I ain't going to say. I'm not. I'm not going to watch it. Um and uh, uh um yeah. I gotta. Well, not, I don't. I don't want to watch it because like it's I, stupid. I, I, yeah. I, I, I saw a couple of people tweeting about it, and I'm like, I'm not ready for it, or I don't really care. Not that I'm not ready. It's just like. It, it, it's apparently just a giant journalist's like suck fest, and I don't. That's care. a billionaire psycho said he's writing a paper on it. Oh, good. Um, yeah, uh, which is fine. But anyways, like the 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 thing too about music is, uh, and I, I talked about this with my episode with Lambda on the Gauntlet. I don't know when that premieres, mm. but uh, key changes from you know the 1960s to today has seen such a massive decline. Oh, you talked about uh, the Morgoth too, yeah. Yeah, uh, Morgoth talked about it too. Uh, so I'm glad, well, Morgoth and I kind of agree on a lot of things in that respect, but, um, basically just that this decrease in key change also, like, I think a lot of like early millennials, um, and everything like pre COVID too. I mean, there was the, the South by Southwest, there was Coachella, there was Lord all these Lusa. big, you know, or even warped tour. Yeah. Right? Warped like, tour. That was, yeah. Yeah. Anyways. So like Summer you had all the, tour. There, <laughs> yes. Um, and so you had. All of these sort I of I saw like, Dying Fetus on Summer Slaughter Tour. But I mean, there was this concert going deal. There was yeah. an event. There was spectacle that was communal. Lollapalooza, um, you know, Woodstock 99. Like all these things that are there that, you know, people can say they're peak millennial shit or whatever. But there was the spectacle that well, was Warped communal. Warped Tour really was peak millennial. That, it, really, yeah. it really was. It really yeah. was. And it was great. Um, and I'm not going to say, I'm not going to, those memories are mine and you can't take them from me. But anyways, <laughs> uh, <laughs> so basically it's like, okay, great. All of a sudden, the spectacle and this communal thing that we were all part about, it grows on the internet too. I mean, John Perry Barlow was writing about this when with the early internet and like deadheads, right? Like there was this place where people could go and experience the live show, even if they didn't have the money to be like a groupie and tour with them all the time. But now that we live in this sort of like society of like constant critique, everything nowadays has to be about, I mean, this is the same way in video games. You're talking about like movies that are designed to be discoursed about. There are video mm -hmm. games that are explicitly designed to be streamed. 
They yeah. play and design gameplay loops. Video games are just with, movies that you could play occasionally. Well, that, I mean, God of War is a great example. But I mean, like, yeah. all of a sudden, it's uh, games that are based upon how can I get people to stream and talk about the game. I mean, the, the Let's Players evolved to the Twitch deal. And now all of a sudden, this is a place where everyone goes to see people play games. And they've got all of these, like, someone did, like, the copy pasta from uh, Shawshank Redemption, where the older guy gets out of prison. And oh, it's like, God. They, don't e- they don't even play video games anymore. They just watch people play games. It's not like how I was on CS 1.6. Oh, that's Quake so 3. sad. And he's just like, yeah, I don't think they've got anything around for an old fag like me. Apparently, you can't even use that word now. They're telling me to go on <laughs> Discord. And I don't know if it's like an IRC oh, chat or something God. else. And it's just like, I, oh, it's a great, so it's sad. a great, it's a great copy pasta. A little voiceover is fantastic. Yeah. But basically, it's tr- we've, we've transitioned from the communal group culture spectacle experience to where everything now is so fragmented and we experience things based on these small niche subgroups and fandoms based upon what they are. Well, and the I mean, fandom you, has overtaken the youth subculture. The, the fandom and the spectacle of the you know parasocial has really overtaken everything. Mm-hmm. I mean, like the, the Swifty or like even the, the 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 K-pop stands or whatever on Twitter is a really good example. If you're not part of that world, and then all of a sudden somehow a tweet goes viral and it crosses over to that Twitter space, bam! Right? Like, oh, the no internet idea. friend had an instant like that where it crossed over into K-pop st- space, and he and was walking uh... into a whole alien planet. Yeah. Um, yeah. Fandom overtook subculture. That's exactly true. Oh man, I mean, can you it, imagine seeing the Ozfest back in the day? I saw. I went to the one summer slaughter that was the Sumerian Records one. It had all the gen bands, so that was pretty fun. Um, you know, that was the Sumerian Records summer summer slaughter. But uh, I keep getting canceled by K-pop Twitter. Uh, that what a hell of hell is to be canceled by K-pop Twitter. But no, but you're right. Apart from like huge like fandom cults it seems that when it comes to like youth culture in general the subculture has sort of like caved in for this more refined cult like fandom reality and uh well because we've just we've reinvented the wheel to some extent i mean think about it we we no longer listen to the news but we listen to the news we listen to your friends talk about the news we listen to our friends talk about the news we don't listen to uh, we, don't listen to Walter, we don't listen to, to, to Walter Cronkite. Yeah. Or we don't listen to Tom Brokaw. We don't listen to Charlie Rose. What do we listen to? Well, we, we listen, listen to, to Newman. <laughs> yeah. you know, we, we, I listen to Night Owls. I listen to, uh, <laughs> I, I listen to the, the Digital Archipelago or Pony Express Radio, whoever you want to listen I to. I get my news from the Night Owls. <laughs> I get my news from like other like anonymous Twitter posters. Like, like it, it went from, uh, you, you basically have reintegrated the idea that now, you know, oh, broadcast yourself, but now really we're going to ensure that you yourself have the very specific kind of uh, argumentation that is the same thing you would have seen on the news. Now it's just for a specific talking point. And what makes it even worse and more terrifying is it's like, at least when it was with Tom Brokaw or, you know, Rachel Maddow or whatever, you knew what kind of talking point you were getting from and you knew the source of it, right? Like you knew MSNBC was pro like progressive neoliberal, you know, pause shit. You knew that Fox news was like neoconservative, like, you know, pander to the evangelical, <laughs> like rightist shit. But yeah. nowadays how the internet is, how vacuous is now semi permeable it is, but also, and this is the other scary thing is, is that it's kind of like inception. Is, is that sometimes we don't know where the original point of our talking points can come from. No. And so, I mean, to go back to unrestricted Your warfare, talking point right? that you see in the news could have originated from Atrazine Griper. Well, not even just that, but like the yeah. talking point that you might have heard in the news might have originated by some intelligence like think PR tank. think tank yeah. on the other side of the world that is now being yeah. floated out. And we know that this exists. Like, I, I don't want to use the most basic example. So let's, uh, we'll, we'll come up with a fake country. Bomalia, for instance, or to shout oh, out Albonia, 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 yeah, Albonia or, or Bomalia, like as Kindly Dropka likes to That's use. Reference right some there. of the some of those people at Bomalia University Bomalia. Uh, will be paid off or get an internship with the Bomalia Department of Defense to mm-hmm. defend and monitor anti-Bomalian activity on the internet. Which a lot of four chanters used to say that that was part of the Bomalian Internet Defense Force. Turns out we know that that's true. 
turns out we know the CIA does it. Turns out we know that you know the FSB and others we know do, the it. Chinese do it. You know, and we know yeah. that the Chinese do it, and we know that every thirty seconds a new Indian logs on the internet for the first time. Oh, um, and so it's just like, wait, let so, me let me do let me do the uh, where is it? Where I'll let you, you know, go into it. Um, did you speak about Peterson and Destiny? No, wait, wait. we're gonna do that. We're gonna no, we're not gonna do that. I, I didn't watch that. No. One. I, um, I don't know. I do not want to devote time to Mister Benelli. Every thirty seconds, a new Indian logs on the internet. Uh, <laughs> uh so Mr. Yes. Benelli, Mister Benelli, I've read every work. I where is it? Where is it, Mister Benelli? I've listed the most obscure one, Freud and psychoanalysis. I have the red book over here. Mr. Benelli, I've read every work of Carl Jung. You've only read a Wikipedia page on Carl Jung, Mr. Benelli. So uh, I th I'm assuming that – oh, sorry. Let me do the Peterson. Uh, Mr. Mr. Benelli. I can't do the Peterson. I can't do that. Um, well, you had to you had to do it like Kermit the Frog, but like on the brink uh, of crime. Mr. Mr. Destiny, uh, I've read every work of Carl Jung, and I can say that you've only read a Wikipedia page of Carl Jung. Uh, <laughs> I have to be like half crying when I do the Jordan Peterson. So, but, uh, no, but you got you have to do it deeper, and then you have to like have your throat. Actually, I'm I'm sick enough. I could probably Mr. do Benelli, that. Mr. Uh, Benelli, we I, I, can y'all read? Try to do a Carl Jung. Uh, <laughs> yes, we can read, but that isn't a half bad. Uh, yeah, your 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 Norman Finkelstein impression was uh, was great. What's my most obscure young? Uh, probably um, nobody. My most I have all of his collective works. Probably. Um, Oh, his letters, that cost me a pretty penny. Probably his Zafingia letters, because that's when he was in university. That's probably the most obscure Carl Jung book. I have other ones I wanted to buy. I only have the abridged version of his Nietzsche lectures, but I was going to buy it. But some asshole rene rene reneged the, the, the Amazon uh, sale, and I couldn't get the full lecture. I, I was going to drop $200 on the full Carl Jung Zarathustra lectures. But uh, anyways, go ahead, Prude. I'm sorry. I'm just... No, no, you're... I mean, uh, it's just... Uh, actually, Mr. Destiny's going to be featured in an essay I have coming out tomorrow. And what is with the tomatoes? <laughs> Ooh, Mr. Benelli's featured in an essay? No, 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 no. Just like Destiny is, a, is, is an example. I mean, he's... Uh, he's oh. a, he is the epitome of a man divorced from history. Uh, <laughs> he is... And I mean, like Dave, Dave, Dave the I really did have a post with that comment. Oh, well, I mean, Dave, the distributor, like called it out with um, his last stream that he had. But I mean, like basically, and you did as well with your with your your tweets and how he had quote tweeted you. And I mean, he yeah, was the last the man. Tom thing. With um, Destiny, yeah. Because what what is what is the last man but a man who was divorced from history, thinking that history is ended, right? And now all of a sudden you are living with the consequences that no things did not end. You are not a people with time that ended. And by mm -hmm. being divorced from time, being divorced from history, you have both on a like metaphysical, but like on, almost on an epigenetic level, mm -hmm. you have uprooted yourself from the ground where your roots are. And by deterritorializing yourself, you have said to the rest of the world, these roots are exposed. You can now cut them off. And well, uh, yeah, and that's you what's happened. This, when he talks about human connection, like his ex-wife or whatever, like he really doesn't have um it's like yeah it's fine but I move on blah 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 or like when he talks about No his you son, don't. No you or don't. When he talks about his son like it's very there's something wrong there and there's something wrong. Tell Dogbert to give the mud back. That would oh prude you would have loved that one. That was the the I believe the second season of there was only really two seasons there were supposed to be three but then it sort of went down with the UPN ship. The the second season of Dilbert the animated series they had I've Henry seen Dilbert Kissinger. the animated series. I, I well, know the what Kissinger referencing. one where he yes. like yes. he like uh, he's like under an ironic like neoliberal where he's like, well, you know, the mud is oppressing their economic structure, so it's like we have to take the mud from them or else they're not going to develop. That was like, oh, that was beautiful. That was great. That that was like really like listen. As much as I think Scott Adams is like a goober and doesn't know what he's talking about half goober, the time, he's a goober, but the yeah. goober has a sense of humor. Oh yeah, yeah. He did a, he did do a lot of good. Although I think as he got older in age and after a few divorces here and there, uh time sort of gets the best of you, you know what I mean? Uh plus you know what? 
I, I can't side with Scott Adams because he fucking flipped off Ben Garrison. And uh, I I have to side with my boy again, Ben Garrison. So you know about that feud? Uh, you know? No. Well, apparently, I think they got into a tussle on Twitter. And Ben Gar- he like, Scott Adams, if I recall, wrote Ben Garrison this like deranged letter where he's like, you're the worst comic I've ever seen. You're never going to make it. <laughs> and then I remember when, when, uh, I remember when Scott Adams got canceled, right? For that one stream. Uh, fuck you, tomatoes are serious for the shitty JPB. I know I'm not, I don't have the best JPBs, but anyways, Ben Garrison, he said, listen, like, I know this guy hates my guts and I hate him too. And he's a hack. But I got to agree, I don't think he should be canceled. So I think Ben Garrison was the bigger man in that exchange. I, I really, truly believe that, you know, because Scott Adams, Scott Adams, he has this weird thing where he gets into these petty little fights with people. And he's kind of like that Graham Linden guy. That's like, he's like a leftoid, but he's a transphobe as well. Graham Linden, whatever his name is, that other comic guy. It's like, he's a tra- he's a transphobe, but he hates, he's still a lefty. So he's like a weirdo, like turf. It's like these people, like com- a lot of comic guys, they get in these like weird little fits with people. Well, because they strange. lose that. Because I, I mean, yeah, I think with a lot of comics, especially like lefty comics, like you get in trouble oh, yeah. really fast because you lose out on all of the, all of the, like the '90s shit live comedy stuff. Like, yeah, if you were a comedian, like, if you, well, I mean, if you were like, I mean, like if you were a libtard yeah. comedian in the 1990s. The world was your oyster. Oh, I mean, you God. never you can make fun of gay people, but you never disagreed with the lifestyle. Mm-hmm. Not that there's anything wrong with that, as we saw on Seinfeld. You could use uh, Andrew Dice Clay as a punching bag. Andrew Dice Clay, right? Great example. Um, you could also do all of this stuff to make like all the Seth MacFarlane like new atheist tropes of the early two thousands. And I mean, like, so now all of do, a sudden, yeah, the George Carlin religion is a bunch of fucking nonsense. Like, so, that I mean, was, like, like you, you, you get all of this, like, all I mean, like, so, but because the left. <laughs> It is gone bananas, right? And put put the banana emoji in chat, <laughs> they've right? Gone, they've lost because they've gone marbles, completely bananas. Yeah. They've lost them marbles. Um, <laughs> all of a sudden, why do non comedians call non comedians civilians? Because they act like they have the toughest fucking job in the world. And yeah. oh, you bombed because your jokes sucked. Well, I'm sorry. Um, uh, wham, you know. Uh, and they, well, even it, comedy is sort of dead because of podcasting. Because or even the internet. Drama, ironically, like, like the last. Because I, I mean, like you look at. Uh, uh well i mean the podcast i mean it's still a live show that people did it but i mean like uh comedy bang bang right like at least mm-hmm. there was some at least that some of that was funny because i mean at least paul f Tompkins can be funny and has like moderately good impressions like he has probably one of my favorite Werner herzog impressions where like paul f Tompkins does a <laughs> review of a trader joe's on like the criterion collection and it's fucking funny um <laughs> nevertheless right like you have the uh, you have the problem, however, that comes with it, where like all of a sudden, the all the things that you can make fun of, oh, the left actually worships it, you know, and it's like, yeah, we yeah. just make fun of gays. Well, like now we worship gays. Like, oh, black people be like, well, now they worship black people, and it's just like, okay, great. So, uh, comedy is over for these people because it's Comedy's like, oh, I can't make fun now. of it. Well, yeah, I yeah. mean, like, look at all the the Nanette Gadsby stuff that like Netflix was trying to like put up. And it was like Mr. D were talking about that, and he was like choking. It's a short, ugly lesbian telling me about how great being a short, ugly lesbian is, and it's like this is not fucking funny. Like I'm sorry. I was telling Mr. D. Oh, I I let the cat out of the bat. By the way, next week content mining will have Mr. D. Just have to edit it like a lot because there's a lot of swear words. Um, we were talking about, and he couldn't believe me. He had to look this up midstream. They gave Hannah Gadsby. Nanette, they gave her in New York City a Pablo Picasso gallery tour. Like she does the tour in the audio book. So when you're looking at a lot of the later works of Pablo Picasso, she's narrating this gallery tour on your headset. And she's doing this like stupid, like quip. Like even art critics hated it. They couldn't contain like their their libtardation, they were even bombing on it, saying like this is terrible. And then there was a lot of people at the time. This is a few years ago, or two, like last year, the end of twenty twenty two. And even like a lot of art critics were like, "Are we putting the woke away in the art world?" And of course, that's nonsense. And Mr. Deed t- said like that's total nonsense. But Hannah Gatsby, 
uh, she's going, while well, you're looking at Picasso's, especially of women, she's making these like snide remarks. Like, could you imagine with that woman being exploited by this old man, blah, blah, blah. And she's making these like half jokes that aren't really jokes. They're just like cutting the legacy of Pablo Picasso. It was so, cr it was incredible. Let, it was less like, than one he year. Couldn't, he didn't believe me. Year. Mr. D didn't believe me, but it's the truth. Look, it's less, and, and you know what the title is? Less than one year. You know what the title is of the of the gallery, the, the what? tour? What, what, what's it called? It's Pablo Matic. Get it? It's problematic. It's Pablo Matic. <laughs> this is what millionaires in the they New York lost their world. Marbles. I, I hate to admit it, but I think since the left has lost their marbles. They paid, you know what they paid? They paid her like a few million to do this, if I recall. They paid her a lot of money to do this gallery tour. Or, or no, I think it was some like some charity, like women's charity feminism thing. And but she still got paid. Though. She still got the, paid. the real artwork can be found when the 15 year old boys are playing and the Denny's at three o'clock in the morning. And <laughs> They tell me what the fuck is up, Denny's, and I think that that's just what masterful the fuck is performance. Up, Denny's? <laughs> I just think that that's a masterful piece of art, right there. It's very, yeah, very problematic, Griper. Problematic, Griper. Uh, there you go, Bill, Bill Bill Wilson doing such a good job in chat. He's doing oh, such a great job. Oh my god! This is the total state that Owen McIntyre is warning us about. Unfortunately, <laughs> now here I stand, still recovering giving you all this awful impression. It's a good time. We'll be back. You use Anyways, when you do that. Um, yeah, I should, right? I, that would only yeah. make my throat on, only worse. God bless. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, no, but that's enough. great. No, but that really shows when, we that, enter, like... when you enter the New York Med Gallery and it says it's problematic, you are at, you know, that you're in the camps. And right outside, <laughs> there's going to be a woman there of some mixed complexion with a side-shaped haircut. As you realized that this lesbian has marched you into the new Bergen Belsen. And all of a sudden, you realize like that Bath was right and it's over for you. You had less it's than like one when year. I went. It's like when I went to the Warhol Museum and like the front desk was being womaned, let's say, by. It was a fun experience, but um, I shouldn't say that. It was a great experience. I really love the Warhol Museum. But. Uh, <laughs> But in the front, but the front desk was being personed by, you know, put it that way, um, which is very funny. It's another thing me and Mr. D talk about how they like made that the highlight of Andy Warhol's thing, his sexuality. But that was like the thing he hated the most. Like he had the most complications with. He had the mm. most problems in his life. He like he infamously did not like other gay people, you know. So he was like Andy Warhol was incredibly homophobic. When you read his diaries, it's it's hilarious. Yeah, um, I mean, Mr. Mr. D's read quite a few passages, and I mean, yeah, he's got the whole, yeah. <laughs> the life and works of Andy Warhol, which is, the like, the most detailed oh fucking, like, it's, like, what, 23 parts? You know, it's, yeah. like, you have 23 hours plus of gallery, artwork, diary reading. Like, it's arguably the most well-put-together documentary on his entire life, put together by one online octopus for free <laughs> yeah don't say that our shit no. doesn't have anything good um oh, uh, but speaking man. of but speaking of shit that was terrible uh um trump trial you want to do that next? well the trump trial uh also the oh my god just like uh we I, I think we were talking about this before we went live on the air but i was having a conversation uh with a friend of ours about like how it seems that the 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 time lag between like not you know like regular world normy political discourse versus like the overly online e politics mm. of like the the discourse schizoanalysis world. discourse whatever you want to call it right like i noticed like that gap is sometimes it's like really close behind and then sometimes it's like 10 years behind um which means that the future of um you know wherever this online discourse goes is always interesting but like like last week, I went to that thing uh, at the Free Press, uh, talked about it a little bit um, on uh, on the Old Glory Club and things like that. But like, it was weird to have like a five to nine year gap play out, like Monochrome mentions in chat. Like, it's about a five to nine year gap, depending on who it is. Because like, I sat down there and I was laughing with my friend the whole way through. We were like boomers arguing with our TVs. And then all of a sudden, um, 
you know, I listen to I listen to Ann Coulter get up and talk. She's super skinny. Uh, it looks, you know, I, I was thinking about the song. Oh Truckin'. yeah, what happened with the debate? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, you can read my review about it over on the OGC Substack. But like, uh, she got up there, and I, I I couldn't help but think about the 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 line from Truckin' by the Grateful Dead, or it's just like whatever happened to Sweet Jane, you know? She, and she's just like living off Reds, vitamin C, and cocaine, and all of her friends can say, "Ain't it a shame." Cause like, she's like super rail thin and she's kind of like phoning it in. But when you're listening to her phone it in, she sounds like Richard Spencer from like 10 years ago. <laughs> and so she's just like, she's doing everything oh. in her power to not say, listen, these immigrants aren't white. Right. And she's just, she's doing the whole post 1965 immigration bill. She's coming off. Like she was just like listening to, some alt right podcast. Yeah, like from she like was 10... listening to TRS. Yeah, I mean, like she sounds like she's caught. Yeah, that's what she sounded like. And I'm just sitting there with my buddy, thinking to myself, "Dude, what year is this? Like, we just went back in time." And um, she uh, sounds like she's. Well, she... I mean, Seb, yeah. if you were in the area, I would. We well, indeed, go talk about like meeting up or buying you a drink. But still, uh, my friend and I went. It was a fun time, but it was just like, holy shit. I mean, she she says, well, what book should you read? And she's like, Camp of the Saints. It's an actual band. Oh, book. my God. Uh, but everyone else was just awful. And what made mm. it worse is, is that like the, the, the morons on the other side, Nick Gillespie, you know, the guy who runs Reason Magazine, Platforms, Ayala, uh, and then, of course, Chenk Uger. You know, Chenk the, the, Yu-Gi-Oh. Yeah, you know, the, 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 the Turk. And uh, all of a sudden... You're just like, oh, this is awful because uh, the people bought into their bullshit. And you're just like, well, democracy is a joke. Billions must die. Like everything that you would think of on Twitter is just playing in your culture brain. And reiterating takes from from. Uh, <laughs> but I'm like, this is but this is the world of like normie. Need but this is the world ago. of normie politics, right? Yeah. Like this is. This do you remember it. Nick Fuentes Graper on Twitter? I, yes, I do. Not the Nick, but like Nick Fuentes Graper, like. Ann Coulter was literally cribbing takes from Nick Fuentes Graper on Twitter. But <laughs> he's, she's cribbing takes from like, yeah. Stuff oh, that Nick boy. Sala was posting back in 2013. Many um, such cases. Yeah. Many such cases. But I mean, like, and so like that, that was sort of the, and I mean, she's been doing this shit for like 25 plus years. Yeah. I mean, like she did the, uh, she, I mean, Audios America. When did, when did that come out? Cause I remember reading that when I was like a teenager. She published that in oh 2015. So, if it, but I feel like she's been talking about immigration much longer. Well, than he also says, "When is Ann Coulter going to start talking about a certain?" Thing? No, that's Helen Andrews. Actually, Helen Andrews will do it's... that before, uh, <laughs> before Ann Coulter will. Ann Coulter. Helen Andrews will talk because well, I mean Helen Andrews is part already keyed in because she's just like, "Listen, I'm going to say it till it's I'm blue in the face. It's not ideology. It's demographics." And you're she's just like, like, "Yeah, openly race posts." <laughs> I'm just like, "Give me." I well, I have a soft spot in my heart for Ann Coulter, but like, mm. I know Helen Andrews is married and thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife and all that jazz. But like, that Teutonic autism is oh, just man. chef's kiss, and um, she just doesn't care. I remember she got ratioed on Twitter once for like. It was about the subway. And she doubled down. Yeah. And, she was, <laughs> and I was just like, yes, bring it on. Bring it on. Um, but again, oh, it's just many man. such cases. But it was just like, this was pointless. This was pointless. And I mean, all, and all you saw the debates lit- are pointless. Well, <laughs> yes, but no. Because I, okay. And I say, no, 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 no. Hear me out. Hear me out. Debates used to not be pointless. Debates oh, yeah. used to serve a purpose. And I mean, this was something that Span- uh, Spandra was talking about in his most recent post about that debates used to be this well organized the the moderator was just as intelligent as the debaters themselves on the specific issue and it wasn't a place where it was the greatest hits right it was the place where the ideas were debated and you made sure that no one went on a long tangent and did something stupid yeah um and unfortunately the debates that we have now are for fandoms to attack other fandoms and for subcultures to say that they own someone and to get that sweet 30 second clip that they can retweet and go about their day to, to say that they owned them or that they're, they're, they were pointless because no one cares about the, uh, the debate about uh, what was it like Israel a while back that had um, what's his name on uh, Mr. Benelli. No, 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 not that one. Not that one. The one with the guy from uh, rebel news. Which one? There's so many. 
The one where he, oh, for fuck's sake, I'm, I don't remember his name. Ezra Levant? No, no, Ezra? no. The one with uh, Gavin, what's his name? Gavin um, McInnes? Gavin McInnes. And like all this, and everyone remembers that that like clip of him walking away when like the, 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 pro-israel guy said he would destroy catholicism over islam that's all everyone that remembers oh, that debate that one yeah. right like that's all everyone remembers and so like that that's the way that the debates get framed is now just about yeah, but clicks. gavin's like pro-israel is he not like is he pretends because whatever but i mean okay yeah. but th this is how it goes right that, that that's the nature of how debate is i mean for instance i mean espantral said uh ben shapiro great debater what does he believe in absolute bullshit and he knows he's doing total midwittery that's how it is for Dusty doesn't believe in anything. Yeah. Doesn't believe in anything. Total embodiment of uh, mid midwittery, totally deterritorialized from any conceptualization of history to where he would disavow something he said, you know, five streams ago. Yeah. No, he's they, literally they, disavowed they, things he said two streams ago. Yeah. So, right. You know, and so yeah. people get called subversives or feds or, you know, ethnic groups that people don't like. Uh, and that becomes just a non convincing way of how things are done. Which, of right. course, debates are really more or less just a way to have politics without actual politicking because it just becomes mm -hmm. theatrical circle jerking. And that's what it, it becomes is. pro wrestling, really, more or less. Well, yeah. that, that's why everyone likes the term kayfabe. This is why the pro wrestling terminology has dominated yeah. our essence of politics. As it's, pro wrestling wanes in importance, its legacy lives on in mainstream culture. Because, like, have you seen the wrestling world lately? Not very good. Uh, you know. Um, I just remember everyone telling me that uh, what's his name, uh, John Cena is like super balding. It's bad. Yeah. Um, I mean, like the, po the, good, po though, the poser the label is a good yeah, thing yeah. too to to refer back to. I think that there's a, a good thing. He believes in getting paid. Everyone believes in getting paid oh, until yeah. they. Well, that's not true. If I if I really wanted to get paid, uh, I would be a leftist. If I if I had if I was all about seeking that that bread the the stacks, I would not be um fitting in to the eye of a needle right it, i would say screw the eye of the needle screw the gates i would just be a leftist and be i would a be total, like ben burgess if I i'd be a total money. shit lib right now but we're not yeah. doing that because i i don't i like to think i have principles or at least that i have the ability to comprehend new information as it comes into my my worldview however <laughs> sorry prude sorry look at what wrestling's never been the same since that fateful night in 1992, do you mean in a London alleyway with Kevin Nash and a few? Uh, never mind, man. Never mind. Don't worry about. It. Don't do not research. Do not research. But anyways, you know who's really great? Who I might, I could probably convince to come on my podcast. Do you remember Val Venus? Does anyone remember Val Venus? He's pretty based on Twitter. He like calls out. He's like a MAGA like Q boomer. <laughs> he's great, man. Do you remember Val Venus prude? I don't know. He had a prawn star gimmick back in the attitude era. Yeah. He would come out and uh, he had this feud with um, who was it? Mr. Fuji or was it? Um, he had a feud with the Japanese wrestlers and they did this angle where they pretended to like with a katana. Cause he was going after the, the, what was his name? The manager. He was going after his, uh, hot Jap uh, Japanese wife and they had this angle where they dragged him in a room and the lights went dark and they uh it was implied that they chopped off his you know what with a katana really great amazing amazing well no this year's WrestleMania was amazing because of the rock let's let's all be real not because Cody won because of the rock that's the only reason the rock and Undertaker that's the only reason they tuned it. Yes, Kaintai. Sorry, it was Kaintai. It was uh, it was Takamichi Noku. It was uh, Funaki, and I forget the other guys who were part of Kaintai at the time. But anyway, yeah. <laughs> then he was. But here's Prude. You'd like this one, okay? So Val Venus had a prawn star gimmick, right? But yeah. then he became the leader of a group called Right to Censor, where it was like a kayfabe of the network that's trying to like create like wholesome family values in wrestling. It was very funny. It was very, so he became like reformed prawn star. And then he became an evangelical censorship Christian in the network. The, yeah. It was very funny. We should get, we should get Valvina's son. He could come on. Yeah. That'd be interesting to say. <laughs> no, but he like exposed a lot of like the woke tardation in like modern wrestling. And he like, <laughs> he's great, man. He's like a Q boomer on Twitter. 
It'd be fun to actually have that interview. I mean, just to say yeah. the least. Uh, one, of, one of the people I would love to get on, who I think has just gone batshit insane since COVID, uh, is the uh, uh, fellow, you know, your fellow Canadian, uh, Tom Green. You know, oh my god, that'd be incredible. I would Tom love Green, to, yeah. I would love to interview him. Yeah. I know he probably does not want to talk to some right wingers, but I would love to just pick his brain for 20 minutes and oh just ask him why, what, what has happened to him and what is he doing these days? That'd be a lot of fun. Be a yeah. lot of fun. But no, I mean, this goes back. I mean, every time. Did about, you like, watch you Tom know, Green's Basement, the, the talk show? I did. <laughs> oh, my, you were a hardcore Tom Green. I, yeah. Not really, but I mean, I, I liked. Um, Dude, where's my car? I, I liked a lot of dumb comedy. And so, someone in chat said that Brood probably liked Dane Cook in 2008. I was uh, barely, you know, a uh, teenager around that time frame. I thought he was funny. Uh, I now have learned the error of my ways and know that I was a retard teenager back then. He's not funny, but nevertheless. Uh, yeah, 2000, the, the late, the, the recession era, 2000s, early 2010s was a weird world. Oh, it was man. great. And I don't yeah. regret a single moment of it. Actually, I have a lot of regrets, but that's a whole other choice. Uh, but no, I mean, like this just goes back to the, the nature of, of, of debates and uh, tangents, because that happens so much on these damn uh, shows and things like that. Because what was uh, well, one of the things that we were going to talk about today was the uh, face off, right? Um, the whole Chris Rufo. Uh, right. Curtis Yarvin face off. Uh, so first off, let's talk. Let, let's talk about the theatrics of it. Let's talk about the spectacle. Oh, well, um, I thought you wanted to talk about the Trump trial first. What's eh. the, but what's there to talk about? Like they're going after him. What's, what's they're going to go after him? I mean, like the the state has unlimited resources, and uh, we now know that, that from the jurors. I mean, this was that second city bureaucrat tweeted out. Like there are more than one. There's more than one attorney on the jury panel. What? You almost never want an attorney on a jury panel. What in what fucking world, right? You know? Um, oh, it's a stitch up, man. Yeah. But still. Um, uh, I got to say, Dan Cook was never mine. I was thinking Jeff Dunham. He had a great bit on the. I have oh, yeah. quite a few Jeff Dunham shows. Like, Jeff Dunham is like middle America's safe global war on terror, George W. Bush comedian. Like, like Larry the Cable Guy. Like Larry the Cable Guy and the Blue Collar Comedy Tour, which <laughs> yeah, I like, have seen. Well, Ron White was kind of vulgar, but he was. I have good. seen Ron White live twice um, in his later post Blue Collar Comedy Tour years, and he's great. Um, because uh, like uh, I saw him, he he went to El Paso one time, and I got oh, to see man. him, and it was he's he's sitting up there, cigar, scotch. Uh, he had some Mexican guy shilling, um, I think, some kind of tequila that he was part of or whatever. And he was trying really hard not to talk about, like, Trump and the wall. And someone brought it up in the audience. And he's he went on this, like, 10-minute bit about Canadian geese and how we need to build a wall around Canada. And it was fantastic. Um, oh, my God. But, like, that's such an era of, like, comedy or... Well, I say that in quotes, but, I mean, like, it was such a... That, that's a bygone era, right, of, like, that oh, post... Yeah uh late 90s early 2000s like you know white people have their own uh, white people don't have culture well you know you're a redneck if so i mean well it was too innocent for most people in comedy you know what i mean it was too hokey and it just couldn't survive well because i mean what were your choices back then you had like andrew dice clay or you had bill hicks or you had george, george carlin. Yeah, bill hicks or george carlin and you yeah. had like and then of course you had sort of like the the nasty screwball dirty comedy i mean a lot of that was dane cook you know, like well, you um, also like more sophisticated like women's lib version. You had like Jeanine Garofalo, like you had. Well, you know. yeah, but I mean, you you had all these other variations of it. Oh yeah. So, I mean, if you wanted, if you were like a middle American white guy that like was part of some moral majority shit or whatever, and then you uh you have to go and like look for something else. You you went to your you went to your Jeff Dunham's you went to your mm. blue collar comedy tour um, and I mean American culture is weird American culture is so fragmented and regionalized it's really hard to say yeah. that we have a a particular um, culture and then of course like the greatest uh, gross out comedians were always uh, Jewish women yeah I mean there's a lot of those <laughs> Lisa I mean, Sarah, yeah. Sarah Silverman is the most disgusting comedian of them all 
Um, and I remember like she was taking advantage of early YouTube as well because she would do mm -hmm. um the whole I'm sleeping with Matt Damon bit. Uh she, she did, did the, skits, she was the first to do she, skits. Well, she did well, YouTube. she did like music video style skits, is what yeah. there was. Um and then of course you have like the the safe white sort of like quasi shit lip ones like Jim Gaffigan I think is a really great example of this. I think his mm -hmm. politics are pretty like left or like to the left. But I mean um you know yo mama in chat you could also do the same for me. But hey whatever, you know, pay the other guy more. Um the the other thing too is is uh the guy who did funny songs. Well there's quite a few. Um Bill Burnham. Bill well no Bill before Burnham, him there Bill was Burnham, yeah. um what was his name? Stephen Lynch, right? He did a lot of like dirty comedy skits with his like guitar. There was a uh, there was Rodney Carrington. He was like the dirty <laughs> sort of like redneck comedian type as well. And yeah. He's got some really disgusting songs that uh, I. It was I like David on Co. did the X-rated hits album. <laughs> that was funny. Dimitri Martin also did a lot of stuff as well. But mm. um, Geo, Geo should do a project. <laughs> Bill Wilson. Geo should do a project Veritas, but it's getting on stream with Kevin Nash and graping him. Kevin Nash is, I feel really bad. Like, okay, Kevin Nash is like a total libtard. Like, he's a total, like, blue and on. Like, he thinks Trump is going to, like, detonate the nukes. But I feel really sad for him. His son died, and he's just, he, he's a mess. Like, he goes to these podcasts. It's just, Kevin Nash isn't doing too well. But anyways, I don't feel wrestling. Yeah, there were a bunch of those. Oh, Lewis Black. Lewis Black. I used to actually like Lewis Black back in the day. But it's just, I don't know, man. Like, they was on The Daily Show. Did you watch Lewis Black Prude? I did not know. Yeah, he was all right. Like he was, you know, he I think the way his voice was, but but then I don't know, like all those guys that got he their still start, he still goes on tour, by the way. Is he still alive? Lewis I'm Black? I'm pretty sure. How old is he? He's gotta it's be like, like right. 80. Cause he looked like he was 80 back in the day. He's 75. <laughs> oh my god. But wow. he's still he's still on show he's still on tour. That's incredible. That's incredible. So yeah, I mean he's got he's kind of set to go. I remember that one skit he did where it was um he's like uh the one guy they found the oldest guy that was living in New York and he's he ate um back fat like a like a hog fat yeah with toast and like a like a quart of Thunderbird wine every day. And they're like, no, you have to like go on a diet with fruits and vegetables. And he goes, if he would have changed his diet to fruits and vegetables, he would have been dead in a week. <laughs> you know? The guy was like 102 years old. He said, I didn't, I don't eat bacon because it's too lean. <laughs> you know, oh, that was a funny one. But yeah, Lewis Black. But then he would go on the Daily Show, and uh, he, he's the sit down comic. That's for sure. Yeah, like all those, like I don't know, all the people that got their like wretched spawn from the Daily Show. Like all of them are just like like who's the who's the leaf? I can't stand her. She's the most obnoxious. Like even worse than Sarah Silverman. Um, what's her name? B. Something B. The Daily Show one, but then they gave her their own show, but then it tanked. Nobody cared about her. Samantha oh, B. Samantha, Samantha, Samantha B. B. Oh my god. It's her whole shtick was I think she called Ivanka Trump like uh, the "see you next Tuesday" word. Um. But like, yeah, like another, yeah. well, cause I mean like the whole genre of the tonight show, I mean like the, I mean, say what you will about like the shit liberty of, um, Conan and show? all that, like the, the night show format of like the, the late show wars between Conan, uh, between Conan O'Brien, Jay Leno. I mean, of course, Craig Ferguson got his own shtick and then David Letter, like these people are all awful, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. All, well, I actually Craig Ferguson is my one respectable like late is night. Is Jay show Leno all right? Jay Leno is okay. I mean, yeah. Jay Leno used to be funny. I will say this. Jay Leno used to be funny. Not so much today. But I mean, he's he's you know, fucking multimillionaire. He can do whatever he I wants. Heard he was terrible to work with. But they're all terrible to work with. Oh, I'd imagine so, right? Yeah. But Even like, like Conan's delusional, but like whatever, <laughs> you know. They're all awful. They're all, all terrible. But I mean, like, the, the, comedians the are thing, terrible people. The fun, the nice thing is, is, is that the internet has killed all of these shows. Yeah. All of these, all this entire late night format is fucking dead. And our Does friend, anybody care about Seth MacFarlane? Or no, no. sorry, uh, Seth, what's the guy's name? Seth Myers. Seth Myers. No, the other guy. The, ba the, the, the guy that's not funny, that it's got no personality. I don't know why he's on there. 
Do you know how little that narrows it down? Oh, what's his name? Stephen Colbert. Not oh, not Stephen. Stephen Colbert is the worst. But like, I mean, no, the other guy, the other guy, not not Seth Meyer, not Stephen Colbert. Jimmy Fallon. Jimmy Fallon, like, no personality, no per. Like, what? Why is he there? Because well, Jimmy Fallon likes to live in this world. And I was about to say this is goes back to what our friend Wade Stotts was talking about. Mm. Jimmy Fallon likes to think it's 2010. Oh Jimmy Fallon wants to go back before the woke existed or whatever. Yeah. And then of course the overlapper. I mean, cause I mean that he got to start on SNL. This is the thing is, is that Jimmy Fallon was supposed to be the straight guy that always breaks. If you watch any of his shit from SNL, he is always the straight man who breaks. That was the bit, right? Um, although he does have that one funny skit about being like an Italian um, about like corks and, mm. um, again an old like again gay joke back in the 90s it's kind of funny um but (laughs) jimmy fallon of course likes things 2010 and that's the way that it goes but now uh as our our friend radical liberation stephen carson likes to point out is it's just like really the whole shtick about these things is is that it's celebrities talking to other celebrities to promote their slop for you to watch yeah Uh, which is why norm Macdonald is probably like one of the still greatest things that we ever had because he had that very early on when he was still on SNL. He had that one with um, the the chick from Melrose Place, and they used she was which doing a oh with, yeah yeah What's the, the, the whole carrot top skit where he's like yeah it yeah. should be called seven and a half seconds or box office point like you know that kind of stuff is nice every now and then <laughs> yeah um it's all again the internet has killed this format which is good mm-hmm. um however. We have seek we seek our theater and we seek our spectacle in other ways. And for the internet generation, especially the early internets and politics, it was internet blood sports. It was the debate world, uh, and we still get our our kicks off of it today with e drama and shit like that. Well, and we saw and we and yeah. we saw this spectacle cafe play off over the last year now over over Twitter, over on Substack, which led to this whole I am seventeen seventy six stick. Because Yarvin would criticize Rufo on strategy or whatever. And then, like, you know, Rufo would go on Twitter and basically say that, like, Yarvin is, like, a, a, a dickless nobody. And, I mean, that, that was the way that it went back and forth for, like, a year. It's two, it's two very egotistical people fighting each other. But, uh... It's, it's, yes. Well, no, yes. but I was going to say, before we get into that, like, there was a moment... Because someone mentioned uh, Whitest Kids You Know... There was a moment in early YouTube and a lot of that did come off from other sites. Like you're the man now dog. It came from like, um, even new on new grounds. Well, new grounds is more animation, but it came, it was like a bunch of like comedy, like groups, like for example, uh, SMB, was it SMBC that had the comics, but then they also had like the, they would do comedy skits. Then you had funny or die would do wow. that. I don't know, no, no. Saturday morning breakfast cartoon. That was SNBC, and that yes. was Zach Wiener Smith, and he did. He was like, he was similar to XKCD, where it was like the science based kind of like new yeah. atheist comics. There was E Bombs World, E Bombs World, and yeah. Beretta. Oh yeah, um, yeah, yeah. But I mean, like, no, what, what's funny? They would what's do funny, funny is that Wiener Smith ended up being like a libertarian, where he was like pro mm. open borders, and he like did a whole book where he was the illustrator for all this cringe. And you're yeah. just like, oh, yeah. what is gone? What has happened? But, but they would do like on YouTube, they would do these skits and then Funny Your Dad would do skits. Then Cracked would do skits. Then like you had a Barely Political. Remember Barely Political? They're like, are they still around? I don't know. Like you had a bunch of these people and then Whitest Kids You Know, of course, was in this. You need, you need the, you need like so, the, the old, like the ancient Giga Chat. Yeah, the like ancient all the gray. Giga, do you, but do you remember no, 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 really it, YouTube? It would, yeah. it would be like, do you, re- do you remember, do you remember Jib Jab? And you're just like, you know, yeah. blown out for xkcd where the x stands for reddit the k stands for reddit the c stands for reddit the d stands for not funny i used to i used to read uh saturday morning breakfast i used to read a little bit of uh xkcd I back to those not too long ago college, like every humor, now and then, college humor college humor but that's all gone now it's all nobody gone. cares about comedy skits on youtube and anymore thank, and thank god for it and i would thank argue god. They're thank all god they're all funny hacks it. Well, barely political was kind of funny a little bit. Um, I know some of those semi breakfast skits were kind of funny, like the cooking ones. But like, yeah, it's gone, man. You, it, I, I I hate to say it, but the best one of them was whitest kids, you know. And they and then the guy died 
a few years ago or something like that. He died um, recently. Yeah. What was yeah. his name? Uh, why does? This... Oh, Smosh! You remember Smosh? I used to. Want... I, I shouldn't admit yeah, that. Yeah, Trevor. Yeah, Trevor Moore only died a few years ago. Yeah, Trevor Moore. Yeah. Yeah. Did you, did were you a Smosh kid, Prude? Twenty-one. He died in twenty-one. Uh, no, I was not. Rather more. Yeah. And then the Onion, of course. But now we're just doing the the retarded uh, millennial reminiscing shit. Is what we're I, I right kind of like Smosh a little bit, but then it was kind of stupid, you know. Yeah, skits, skits died. died. Yeah. Oh shit, that is way too. Bright. You know, we have skits. We have Twitter drama now instead of skits. We have yeah, we, we have, have e drama. Yeah, we have e drama. Yeah, we have um, influencers like that kid that goes around harassing people. What's his name? Uh, Jack. Some he's an Irish. Is he Irish or whatever? I don't know. You know, the really annoying kid on TikTok that goes around annoying people, but he has a bodyguard, so no one's going to mess with him. What's his name? He's in a lawsuit now. He might, his life, his life, livelihood's at stake because he can't go around harassing good. people. Yeah, good, good. Good. Yeah, good. I don't care if he has a bodyguard. I, I'm surprised that someone hasn't. Anyway. Oh, he came close, but he's got a body. Yes. Yeah, so his name's Jake something. He's like this really annoying kid. Um, Alex Stein, Last Man Standing. Well, even I. Oh, I don't uh, like Alex don't Stein. Alex Stein. But I'm not. I'm also. He was not really in big. Fish Tank. I gotta say, he did a good job in Fish Tank. That was pretty good. But I'm also not a. Yeah, like Johnny Somali in Japan. <laughs> Johnny like Somali in Japan. Not Jake the Snake. That's just biological <laughs> warfare at a certain point. That's just me. Um, oh. Uh, that's just me. There's a, I that's biological warfare. It's an Irish name. That just sounds Is it like Jake Don me. Jake Dorsey? Not Jack Dorsey. He's not going around harassing people. It's this Zoomer kid with a Zoomer perm. He's got a bodyguard. He's being sued right now. He goes around on TikTok harassing people. Um, AOC is booty strength. I, I, I have been told that this used to be the former Tucker Carlson time slot. So, hey, oh, I think okay, we're doing yeah. pretty good for ourselves. Uh, but no, the other thing to so, Ray so I mean like Johnson. Oh god. The, the the skits have all kind of like died away. Yeah, they're gone now. Nobody skits cares. have died. Often like Well, political satire has died because why have satire when you have the real thing is clownish enough? So who cares? Trump killed it, and I'm so happy. <laughs> yeah. Like, okay, okay, like go go back pre-Trump. What was like peak political drama, right? It was like Madam Secretary, which was just basically, let me please suck off Hillary Clinton. Please let me suck off Hillary Clinton. And then you had uh, House of Cards, which was the remake yeah. of the British show. And all of a sudden, I mean, the only the only good successful comedian left, although, I mean, his stuff is still kind of like political, is uh, Sam Hyde. There are some normie yeah. YouTubers that try skits. Uh, really, the, the skits world has transitioned from IRL back to animation. Because there are some yeah. very popular animators that do some funny stuff. Uh, well, you know anyways. what's funny is that there was MLG players that were doing like back in the day, kiddies here, strap in the old Giga Chad. But back in the day, Let's Plays, you devoted your life to one video game. And that yeah. video game was either Minecraft or Call of Duty. There was a whole bunch of them. Like there was like Scenanners and Tage and uh hutch where they would like they realized that like call of the call of duty era was a pot was up and so they started doing like skits but like nobody cared and so like they're just gone like there's a whole generation of early let's players that were signed on to machinima that made tons and tons of money but nobody cares about them anymore because they didn't change with the times. Well, like, I mean, the, then you have the death of Rooster Teeth, and that's a whole other. Yeah, Rooster Teeth. Our, yeah. our friend yeah. uh, Yellow Lantern has a great um, piece on oh. his Substack called "His Substack is Memory Eternalness." You can go look his uh, his whole piece up on the the rise and fall of Rooster yeah. Teeth. It's a very good uh, essay. Oh, I remember um, Red versus Blue. That was fun. The animation Red. And versus then it Blue. went on for way too long. Like yeah, um, nobody cared. Good yeah. things that. Don't know how to end. Only I mean, use uh, me blade. Do not research. Do not research. Only use me blade. Do not research. Please. You want to know what a destruction of a human being on the internet looks like beyond Chris Chan? I shouldn't. That's just too much of an input. Let's not mention. Let's go to Curtis Aaron versus Chris Rufo because that's too much of an info hazard to, to look at what only use me blade is doing. In the year of our Lord, 2025. I remember Bill Wilson. I remember. Oh, yeah. Um, I also Nostalgia remember... Critic is still chugging along. 
I, I missed that because I wasn't a gamer, so I, I don't remember Channel Awesome or whatever. Do, were you a Channel Awesome kid, Prude? No, I didn't watch any of this stuff. No, I, really I didn't, didn't watch Doug Walker. Or whatever, uh, I did. I, I played video games and stuff like that as a teenager, but I never got into the whole Let's Play thing. I'm a little too... I think you and I are both a little too old for that uh, yeah. to be... I remember high school watching a lot of Let's Plays because I was playing Call of Duty and that for like a few months, and I was like, uh, mm. you know, and I was never much of a gamer. Interesting, but yeah, no. Uh, yeah. Well, I mean, it's I very I still sad. Am. A lot of legends in the internet have come and gone. Very sad. Yeah. Very sad. Um, but that's okay. Uh, now that yeah, our millennial yeah, nostalgia yeah, trip is over, the West, the West has fallen. Um, he's ball, he's Norwood it now. Oh my God! It's the Reaper over. comes for all men at some point yeah. in time. Well, that's not true, but still, uh, the Nor the Norwood Reaper does come for men. It does happen, and uh, yeah. yeah, really, John Tron did win. John and uh, Tron, also, yeah. what the hell is the point of watching random uh, randoms play games? I again, I don't. don't I'm know. not a zoomer. I don't know. I don't know. Well, I used to watch it because it was like the only person I find remotely entertaining who plays video games is. Um, one guy that I watch outside of that, none of this I find interesting, but they also edit everything to make mm. it more entertaining. Um, I used to just, watch Call of Duty okay. Let's Plays because it was kind of like to see a guy like really kill it on Call of Duty, it's kind of therapeutic. Yeah, DSP will always be here, DSP will stream until the sun explodes. You know, what Zizek said about capitalism will be around before the sun, <laughs> capitalism will be around longer than the sun exploding, DSP will be streaming longer than the sun exploding he will so. stream the sun exploding he will stream the sun exploding yeah exactly yeah, well let's plays are for lonely people unfortunately well, to some extent uh yeah i would argue well yeah i guess so i mean i'm not a lonely guy and so i don't know but yeah um i can get i can understand i yeah, don't understand I totally watching understand. other people play games streams himself playing games yeah you people Fair tune social. in and you people pay for it and i don't give a shit sorry um, I'm gonna DSP do anyway. will survive the heat death of the universe. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, that is very true. Mm. Um, no, Chris Raygun is cucked. Is he uh, a bread tuber now? No, but he he's he's deleted some of his old shit, and he's definitely a lefty. Is he still banging Lacey Green or no? They broke up. As a that's old. That's old news. I have no idea. Um, I need you to start video demanding ones five dollars streaming from together. And like, for, no, like I'm people. not. I'm never going to do the uh, passive aggressive. Well, that's not true. One of these days, I will start mystery growth posting, and I will start <laughs> uh, killing the free subscribers for money. Um, yeah, they were, they were, they were banging, or they were dating for a while. Um, but yeah, it happens. Many such cases. Uh, you remember, remember they Lacey had the Green? video where they looked that's, like they that's were a, just that's another that's another one you could do oh, the old giga chat with remember lacy green <laughs> remember muppet feminists oh my remember god when mrs piggy was a real person remember lacy green remember the real world miss piggy that's so true late there was allegation no i shouldn't talk about that for the love of god can we there were video there were matter? there was like photos of this woman doing drugs that kind of looked like lacy green but i don't know if that was real or not it was like spread on on um it's like pure dramatic oh though. the the pre the pre deep fake days yeah, yeah many many such cases what does she do now lacy green she's just I don't know. Is she still doing feminist videos about how like sex positivity or whatever? I don't know. She's still she's still doing the videos about how they have to have like drive through um infanticide facilities. I don't know. It's probably I Crude, don't search Lacey. I'm sure Lacey Green YouTube. Let me go. No, I'm I'm not I'm, I'm not, not doing it to myself. No, I'm good. Lacey you can do that anyways. Green. Yes, new Gloff. I saw the uh the joke you were making there. I'm good. I'm fine. I'll live. Uh, well, the apparently the Leafs are getting crushed by uh, the Florida Panthers, which I kind of predicted. So that means if Boston's getting crushed tonight, that means that they're going to face each other. Oh, well. If she went trad, I hope that she's not making content anymore. Uh, okay. I'm, I'm starting to make that my just like, hey, if you if you shut up, we're good. I'm so glad that my my GF isn't like really online, but apart from being a lurker, I'm very glad about that. Like that's. It's kind of a good thing, you know what I mean? That she's just a normal, normal woman. So mm. she hasn't made a video in two years. Whole, I think. Okay, Lacey Green. I think she works in some, for some univer like organization or university or whatever. 
She just doesn't. Uh, Lacey Green, 2020. The worst thing is speed run gamers. Eh. I don't Whoa, know. I like I like people, right? I like people abusing the Quake engine sometimes. Uh, but no, like the whole speedrunning community has just been so trunified it's over. Like the last like a straight white man like doing anything about speedrunning or, or basically Carl Jobs and fucking summoning salt. Outside of that, I don't think there's any straight people left. Um, you know, uh, but nevertheless. Oh, Lacey it, Green's in graduate school. And she's like worked for some kind of like activist. Oh, uh, someone's like remember Some... Louis Laval? Yeah, I remember Louis Laval. I remember Louis the Laveau, pastor yeah. Louis. I remember the pastor Louis Rance. I remember how he would always like have Sargon on on occasion. He would just like bitch and moan, and it was like classic kind of like alt right rants. And it was just like Jesus. Uh, and then he got like a job to. Uh... Then he got like a government job, and I think he just stopped posting. This has yeah. been like three year, four years since I've heard him on the I internet. I think Lacey Green just disappeared. Yeah, for the best, for the best. Did um, she lose wet? Did she lose some weight? No, she still looks. I think she still looks the same, but it's just uh, there's no, no like Louis, real reason. Louis Laval. Louis Laval was a New Yorker, but for the love of God, can we get on topic, please? I know, but I'm intrigued about Lacey Green. I don't want to. What you can do a Lacey Green retrospective Did, on an episode of Content Minded. I should. I should. People are begging. Listen, for those of you who don't, people know, are begging that Geo talk to more women. People are begging me to. Oh, well, I was going to say people are begging me to do the Kowloon Walled City episode. So, um, oh my fucking Logitech camera, my god. There you go. Um, no, but yeah, people are begging me to do the uh, the Kowloon Walled City one. But maybe I will do a retrospective in Lacey Green because she's like went radio silent. I guess, I guess Chris Ray got like just goon widowed her or something, and she like disappeared to uh, academia. So, come on, Logitech. uh, never, on. never. The, yeah, he's pointing at you, chat. Warning. He oh, because for those who know, if you have a Logitech webcam, yeah, yeah, you have I, to do I know. the. I, I, yeah, you got to. Maybe the it's my thing. light. When I move my light, sometimes. People that are listening to this on Spotify, they're not gonna. Know. Oh, they're gonna. Yeah, they'll love the shit out of this later when I upload it up. Uh, I do need a soundboard. Did you see gonna... that? Did you hear what I just said about how Lacey Green was goon widowed by Chris Hague? <laughs> you know, I like. You know what? You know what's really funny is, is that there is a guy at my church who works. Uh, he, he works somewhere where he has our shit playing on in the background for guys to listen to. I like to think of the fact that there are a bunch of senior enlisted men. I'm talking like E7s, E8s, E9s, guys in their mid fifties doing the whole, their career stuff. And, uh, all of a sudden they're going to hear one day like, oh yeah, Lacey Green Goon Widowed. And it's just like, wow, <laughs> that, that'll be fun. Uh, but anyways, Let's get to the topic, Chris. Thank Chris God. Reagan. Oh my God. Anyways, Prude's real to... name is not Chris, by the way. I just got Freudian slip. So. I need. I, where is my talking gun? That way we can move along. I have the talking gun. Ah. Uh, anyways, okay. I have to go get some water. So you introduce the topic while I get water. happily. Go get your glass um, of water. All righty. Um, you are some horny people on chat uh, today. Good. Lord in heaven. Uh, no, Don Cacino, I go to an OCA parish. I am with the American church. Um, we, are not turn we are not turning this into a podcast about nothing. No, no. This is a podcast about something. Um, I have the same name as future Moldovan citizen. Uh, no, there's no future in my name. So that's, that's not true. But anyway, so what we're going to talk about today is the debate between Chris Rufo and Curtis Yarvin. Host on IM1776. This is our niche e-drama for the evening. And what we were going to talk about were 1.5 hours. I know. I know. This has been a bad episode, Sean. I know. It's been rough. Normally, we get about 45 to an hour in, and then we do it. But here we go. So, anyways, they uh, had a debate. And um, really something to consider in this respect is, is that it was about American history was more or less all of it. I can just put it up on screen and we can go through some of the uh, highlights here. And that's what we'll do. Da, 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 da. I thought the time slot change would mean more efficient. Honest to God. So did I. Um, but Hey, it's the digital archipelago baby. Wouldn't be the show if we didn't rant about nothing, but uh, share screen. Um, didn't Yarvin leave? 
I'm not saying these words. Sorry, I'm not doing it. Um, but here we are. We'll, we'll talk about it there. Let me go zoom in on the screen. You guys are going to make me lose my voice, but that's okay. It's worth it. But yeah, so anyways, uh, we're talking about mainly about the American Revolution in this debate. I'm just going to break it down to you in two areas. Uh, Yarvin is basically saying, you don't read theory. You're not good at what you're doing. And honest to God, you should reconsider your ideological and historical narrative priors before you go on and do what you're doing. Um, whereas uh, Chris is basically saying, listen, I'm actually doing something. A lot of your work has been nothing more but theoretical uh, framing. You've given us some clever metaphors. Now, if you could quit being an asshole and let me get back to my job. That was more or less the the debate that we have here. Um, and you've, you've read this. Gio, what were your thoughts? Mr. Mincelli. Mr. Mincelli. No. Um, There's no Finkelstein here. Okay. Uh, well, um, but... Uh, my thought, okay. <laughs> I thought that, um, they were, hmm, how can I have a deep take on it? Because I think that they could have narrowed down. First of all, it was short for the topics that they were covering. They could have honed in on a few different issues, or this could be a series of interviews between them where they were really talking past each other. Because Curtis was doing the typical NRX trying, or uh, his brand of NRX, not NRX as a whole. He's only, you have to realize, Curtis Yarvin Mulebug is only one aspect of a near reaction, right? There's others, believe it or not. Okay. There's Spandrel, so, there's Land. Honestly, yeah. you don't, I, I, I jokingly said this to, to World's Greatest Dad, but I was just like, you know, I really, Nick Land makes NRX fun. Yeah, I mean that. I mean that with half-hearted sincerity because sometimes it's fun to just have fun, right? Yeah. Remember, kids, the first rule of gun safety is to have fun, exactly. and the first rule of politics is to have fun. And uh, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, there's there's well, th this is this is old school unqualified yeah. reservations, open letter to an open-minded progressive, where we're talking about what is the nature of American uh, history and revolution. And it was really funny because Rufo basically calls. Yarvin for using presentism, um, the whole conceptual idea that we're applying modern day political and moral standards to the historical past. Um, because he's uh, he, he calls because Yarvin's just like, listen, all these guys from the past, the 17th, the 18th, and the 19th and the 20th century, these guys that we're building our narrative about, and this is the whole debate is about narratives and sort of like these mythopoetic mm -hmm. historical narratives and formulas, like they're all leftists. Have you tried maybe looking at it from, you know, Yarvin's point of view, which is the whole monarchy thing, which, of course, let's not kid ourselves. The likelihood of us getting a king or having someone like Steve Jobs run America is not happening anytime soon. And I well, think like, that well, like Nightmare Vision yeah, right. said, it's like it's a whole scaring ideology, but it's not because Chris Rufo like lands on Antifa lists way more than Curtis Yarvin. Yeah, because you know, but anyway, so my point was, um, my analysis is that it's two people talking past each other. One comes from a historical understanding that may or not be tenuous. The other comes from, look at my accomplishments, look at my accomplishments. The only thing you've ever accomplished, Curtis Yarvin, is to fuck a bunch of art hoes in Dime Square and that's it. He like literally almost says this. He's like, what's your great accomplishments? To go and screw a bunch of art hoes. Uh, it, uh, maybe inspire a bunch of like people with, you know, neurodivergency, but like, look at my great accomplishments and look what I'm doing. But Curtis Yarvin is correct though. I will say in one point that Chris Rufo is doing a very hodgepodge mealy mouth conservatard type of leveling of the playing field in the way that normal conservatives do that isn't addressing the root issue of power itself. Right. But my problem is that Curtis Yarvin, like a lot of people in your reaction that refuse to read the French, for example, and Curtis Yarvin famously infamously refuses to read the French, is that they have a very spotty notion of power, but yet for through gun safety is don't cut me off and trap. Exactly. Uh keep honking, I'm reloading, right? That's the bumper sticker. Keep honking, I'm reloading. Yeah. Um, but no, I think Curtis Yarvin. He's not explaining his political formula 
apart from saying that, I mean, I wanted to ask you, Prue, because you're more knowledgeable about early American conceptual history. But my point well, I don't is know that, if I would say conceptual history, but I do well, have a I have a degree in history. Yeah. So, yeah. But but the point being is that Curtis Yarvin, he's very convoluted in terms of how this historical debate impacts current America. Because the reason I say that is because if you look at Curtis Yarvin himself, he admits that he's a realist cosmopolitan. He was born in Italy, raised in where? Romania or not Romania, uh, somewhere in Eastern Europe, former Yugoslavia. His parents are rich. His parents are like Biden apparatchiks in the Democrat Party. Uh, he's like totally disconnected from all the people that listen and read him. But at the same time, Chris Rufo may be more of a quote unquote American than Curtis Yarvin. But Chris Rufo also has politics in like normie conservatism that even though like a lot of Antifa people and a lot of activists on the political left hate him and say that he's dangerous and he's an enemy of the state, which by, all, by any definition, I think maybe is not that far from the truth in terms of like the Biden administration. But at the same time, Rufo doesn't have like, a radical politics in the sense that, you know, that Molbug is talking about. So it's two people that have their own problems of personhood and identity when it comes to people on the political right, from the frogs to normie conservatives. So I think like the, it's very interesting how this debate is between two people that really don't have the same degree of awareness of what average people in the political right in North America experience or go through. Maybe Rufo a little bit more because he is on the ground and he is in a lot of like government policy circles. And apparently the political left are terrified of him because of his accomplishments, quote unquote. But Curtis Yarvin saying that this is a hodgepodge method and that's the same thing. And, and Curtis Yarvin is right. Like what differentiates Chris Rufo from a lot of normie conservative activists, right? Like what differentiates him from like a lot of Fox News people? I mean, I hate to say, I hate to be that harsh on him, but at the same time, Rufo is also correct because what differentiates Yarvin from being a typical cosmopolitan libtard that votes for, that's rides with Biden, that goes to dinner parties that that uh talk, that that supports things like mass immigration because it's like what about all the cool hip restaurants like Curtis Yarvin doesn't have any connection to most chuds on the political right like and he admits this right so both people in this debate are talking past each other they're both barbing each other over their own lifestyle and ideological priors and it just really i think it was a shame because it could have got to the issue of how the right wing seems to be for the past hundred years on the back foot. And I will give it to Curtis Yarvin is that he's aware of that issue. It's just that I don't think Curtis Yarvin has our best interests in mind and that I don't think that he really wants the chuds to win. Curtis Yarvin does not want the right wing chuds to win. He admits this. I think maybe Rufo wants the right wing chuds to win, but he doesn't want the, the wrong kind of chud to win because of course, you know, Rufo was still like, denounce racism and denounce anti this, that, and the other thing. I mean, he'll go hard on the trans issue, but that's about it because the trans issue and sexuality issues are always a ready made excuse for conservative pundits to go hard on that one well, thing. It's the same. We're not having to go hard on race or anything conservative. else culture war politics yes yeah it's, it's the safe edgy of the culture war it's the safe edgy of the culture war to go really hard not even really hard on gay people to go really hard on you know the trans issue uh so yeah that's the problem so i think but and so both men i like here's the problem i have with yarvin and i will end my rant because i want your opinion i'm very sorry but one no, you're good one last point is that Yarvin is, this is the problem. This is why I think I'll never probably actually talk to him is that maybe one day, never say never, never. It's not that I don't want to talk to him because I think he's like, um, he's like morally corrupted. Although I think that maybe his morals aren't in check. He's not someone like there. Listen, in the BTR days, there are a lot of people that I would not have talked to that. There's three people in particular that love made me stream with that I think are totally morally reprehensible. Ayala, Vito Gaswaldi, and Mr. Girl. I wish I would have never done those streams. I'm just being honest. But again, I didn't control the booking. 
but it, still, I should have just logged off. I know I'm very sorry. Though, but apart from that, it's not that I say I won't want to talk to Yarvin. It's just that with Yarvin, I'd rather talk to him about other things besides what he usually like. You know, Yarvin does the greatest hits thing, where he like. Well, the problem is, the is that trip. most of the people that he talks to don't rein him in. Like, this is you, what I mean, Prue. It, this is what it, I'm getting. If at. I were to talk to him, I would basically just be like, "All right, you're going to shut the fuck up, and we're going to talk second. about this for five minutes, yeah, and then we're going to move on." Because the that's problem, the problem. He doesn't. No one has a leash on him. No one needs exactly. to like take a cane around his neck and just say, we're done talking about this. You're going to shut up. And now we're going to focus on the specific issue because if not, what does he do? He goes back to things like the American revolution, Hitler lives, the, the German cat, all the, and that's the problem with like podcasting in general. And I mean, this is where I agree with Spandrel is, is that, um, you know, like most people are really shitty interviewers, my, oh, myself yeah. included. Uh, and again, this is this is the Yarvin problem. This is that he has some interesting insights. The problem is, is that I don't want to deal with a million tangents, um, and that's the problem. However, well, no, the the problem I ahead. have is that Yarvin he always has this thing where he has to prove his intellectual superiority, and I personally believe it or not, I don't really like that in people. I think that if you want to openly engage with someone and you want to have an idea exchange like if you want to have a conversation the problem with Yarvin is that he always has this particular proclivity off of trying to always appease um his own ego around his intellect so here instead of like like he basically treats uh Rufo as an uneducated goober that's like another conservative activist yeah exactly he vomited bibliography at Rufo just to basically prove his intellectual superiority, he did, he almost pulls a destiny. He almost like uh, he does a higher minded version. Well, of destiny. he he he, he yeah. oh well, he almost destiny he, will quote little tidbits of Wikipedia pages at you. Curtis Yarvin will actually have read the books, but he'll th strategically throw things to jam a span. Do you the even years read? Is the yeah. is the is the whole shtick here? You don't really read. Exactly. Is everyone everyone's talking? I mean, I agree with that. That the, the initial premise. Everyone is talking past each other, and I get it. I get it. The the people in chat are complaining. They're like, well, he just wants to go back to 1985. He just wants to go back to 1995. Who Rufo? Well, yeah, that's the, that's the complaint. Oh, that's no, but that's a warranted critique of Rufo. My, that's true. Sure, sure, yeah, okay. Yeah. But in in the world of political realism, I know you're more sympathetic to Rufo than I am. But well, yeah. I'm not. Well, I am, but I'm not because I've uh, I, my my critiques of him. I, I will. I'd like to flesh out in an essay, but because I I think it deserves more thought than just like some thoughts on a live stream. Uh, that's that's my personal take on that issue. Yeah. But I mean, the the problem. In, in the world of political realism, it going back to 1985 would be a fucking great start. Start. However. It'd be paradise however, compared to now. <laughs> it'd be paradise compared to now. You're absolutely right. I mean, I think it was like Wall Street retard that basically had said on Twitter. I love these people's usernames. They're great. Where he basically said, like, listen, if we just stop immigration and, and actually enforce the laws in the books, that fix 70% of our problems. And I think he's absolutely right. The problem is, is does no one on the right has the political willpower, imagination, or organization to consider this. And I think that this is the big, big problem that comes with a lot of like conceptualization of pol politicking. Yeah. Is is that none of these, and, and th this is every. I think every, it's sort of one. It's the elephant problem and the blind men. Everyone grabbing at different parts of the elephant, trying to tell you what they are. Yes. So I mean, for instance. Uh, as I've, I've I've referenced on the show, I am what Yarvin would call a professional progressive. I work inside the cathedral. I work inside grant writing, money distribution, organization of financial projects to get things built, done, executed projects, etc. Glorified worker in government, I am like Ron Swanson, except I actually hate the government. In this respect, the system is awful with respects to you have incredibly woke people or whatever you want to call it. They're all, they're all, they're communists, leftists, whatever you want to call them. Leftists run the system. The system, however, is incredibly resilient despite the fact that leftists are running it into the ground. It, despite means, the uh, bioenism either. Yeah. Despite, well, yeah, because the system is designed to function regardless of like the 85 IQ retard that's running it. Right. Now, because of this, um, the system for say, a, a red state like Arkansas or Tennessee or whatever. A lot of them, 
a lot of them get screwed over because and a lot of, so i mean even in this debate that happens they're like well when do, when do conservatives say that things got off track well uh i think you you have to start at the 60s you have yeah. to not because of the fdr thing or because of the, the previous in the 30s or whatever i think you really could you you could start there and i think that you could make a convincing pro american argument for it the thing to also consider is is that the great society has radically recreated take it built off of what fdr did yeah you built off of the the like housing and urban development the great society programs has essentially restructured the american taxpayer system to where now the state governments are for for worse and sometimes for better utterly dependent held at the point of a gun and also held at the point of the purse to do this or else Meaning that if a city in Arkansas wants to apply for a grant to build a new water tower or whatever, there are a million different loops that they have to jump through requiring other organizations like Council of Governments and other things that are now going to force them to deal with new jobs, new sinecures, more money being moved and lost that doesn't go directly towards what the taxpayer needs, but instead funds all these other programs. And in doing so, that stuff is uh, forcing the states to now deal with like DEI in ways that – why is it that if someone who lives in fucking rural Arkansas, why does he have to go out of his way to go look for women and minority-owned businesses in a, in, a, in, a, in a municipality area that's like 85 to 95 percent white, right? Like there, mm -hmm. there's no point for it. But because of these things and because of the laws that have been introduced – on the you know fucking register, uh, you know the, the the federal register, the CFR. That's the way that it has to go. And so that's well, one that that's just... one facet. That's one yeah. facet. I'm, I mean, that, that's just for fucking housing and urban development. We're not talking about education. We're not talking about you know interstate public works, public works, and things like that. It's a huge leviathan. It's a huge beast, right? And I mean, I coincidentally like the heritage people are kind of trying to talk about that with Project Twenty Twenty Five because it's a 900 page book and doing all that stuff. And so be it. Rufo is doing some of this. However, the problem that I have is, is that what, the, what is, what are, what all of his scalping, right? Scalps that he's taken. They would not happen. If not, because of what happened on October 7th, they mm -hmm. would not happen because wealthy elitist, uh, you know, alumni donating, particularly the Jewish billionaires like Bill Ackman, would not be so up in arms about, oh, wow, these like college kids are really insane for being genocidal rhetoric towards their own in-group bias. They really so, hate Israel. Yeah. They really hate Israel, right? Yeah. And I mean, so like, I mean, even Tucker Carlson was like, well, where were you guys doing this when they were talking about like white genocide for like the last 50 years? All that I'm, all that I'm seeing And is by the way, me and Prude do not use that word because we feel like it's kind of inaccurate that Replacement's yeah. a better word. Yeah. Well, yeah. replacement's a better word. But well, we'll get into that. Well, if you or if you really want to know my thoughts on that term, you can go listen to my review of Jeremy Carl's uh book that will be premiering. They got uh, hit with the Wikipedia article by they got hit with the they got hit with a Wikipedia article. Uh but that premieres oh. uh that premieres literally next week. So you can go see that. Um, however, what I'm seeing is the reemergence of social neoconservatism. Oh yeah. Well, where it's anti-woke and we're going to do some minor changes to, you know, the DEI civil rights stuff and reinstitute freedom of association. And they talk a little bit about this in here. Yeah. The problem, however, that really does emerge out of all of this mess is going to be that it never goes far enough or that they're not going to stop the things that matter. And I mean, and, and this is, this is it, right? Like this is going to be the debate forever while, Yarvin's critique of all this is basically like there is no techno optimist manifesto or anything like that. It's just got to be all right. Imagine South Africa and imagine yeah. all this. And I mean, like even Oren of all people, the great boomer whisperer himself is like, this is the neocon cycle over and over again. This yeah. is what happens. And I don't want Rufo as much as I think he has some good intentions and good ideas. I don't want him to be the next Bill Buckley. I yeah. don't want him gatekeeping this. No, because but that's what already... said. said. He's, like, he's right. Who he's appointed right. these people as the leader of the right wing, the dissident right? Who appointed them? Was there a no council? One. 
I never get well, I never get put on eight charts. We're not invited to it, but we yeah. you know we we don't get we don't get Manhattan Institute money and we don't get Bill Ackman money. And we don't get Thiel money either. And we don't get Thiel money either. Because yeah. if we by if the we way, got... let me address that for people in the chat. Yeah. Because I am fair and balanced, and I don't mean to bash people. I don't mean to speculate on other people. Some of them are my friends, but people have speculated. But when it comes to the top, when it comes to Yarvin and I mean Yarvin was his best friend at one point. So is it like that stretch of an imagination to say that him and Theo have the same interests? I no. mean, I'm not I'm not maligning Yarvin. I'm just saying that where does Rufo get money to wage his campaigns against it? I mean, there's a lot of donors, there's a lot of people in Florida, there's a lot of people that are like sympathetic elites or whatever. But I mean, okay, I understand like a lot of schizos have made a lot of hay on the whole Theo Bucks thing. But I mean, the reality is that yeah, there kind of is people that fund things to distract from certain narratives above others. There kind of is people that want you on the right wing to talk about certain issues over other. It's true. It's not like it's reality. It's like every political side has money. There's money somewhere, right? It's we don't get money, but apart from you people. But yeah, we re we really don't. Yeah, and no, I mean, if you I, have I'm no just saying, I don't mean to malign, malign no, people, ahead. prude, but I think that. There's been people that have poisoned the well with going into how people are connected in the E right. But I mean, is there probably some Theo money going around? Yes, probably. I know I don't know about it because I'm my own man and Prude is his own man. But I not to speculate on certain people. Well, I mean, apart from Curtis and Rufo, I mean, they're pretty much. I mean, like again, Kurt. I'm only saying this about Curtis Yarvin because he was his best friend, not best friend, but you know, he was friends with the Peter Theo, if I recall. Didn't he work for Peter Theo? Or, uh, I, I believe Teal is the one that helped make Urbit possible. Yes, yes. So I'm not speaking out of line. I'm just saying that I don't want to accuse specific people. But if someone today conclusively proved that certain figures were there's some organization behind really big like Kohler accounts or whatever, then I'm like, yeah, you know, it kind of does make sense. Like, you know what I mean? I'm just because I don't want to be like, oh no, because. Us people in the E-right were so pure and moral and we would never take money. Like, that's bullshit. You have to be real about these things, right? Now, I'm not accusing people of anything, but I'm just saying that there's a temptation there. You know what I'm saying, Prude? Yeah, sure. Not to say with everybody, but I'm just saying that, like, if you get to a big position where you're going on Fox News, where you're being entertained by people that are, like, semi-mainstream, you know, there's always people that send you emails about whatever, you know, so that's just the reality of it. Um, and I, just Prude, get, I just yeah. get spam YouTube emails about reviewing shitty Amazon products. So if you want me to review a film, $100 by PayPal is in the link. Same goes for literature and other uh, essays. But oh, yeah, yeah well, um, you know what I have to read for money? I have to read this. I have to review this by Beverly Lewis. About uh, I have to review a girl boss Amish romance story. I'm gonna. I don't know. What am I gonna say? What am I gonna say? I'll find. You, I'll you, find you, a way to. For you two you hours get what you this. grift. You get what you grift. <laughs> this is what you've been reduced to. Like please the time that feel, you said. Please, Peter, feel. Give, like that time that you said that you would money, you would tweet please. out stuff that people would super chat you. So I mean, like, let's not kid ourselves. That's true. It's true. Uh, grift for the grift's sake. So yeah, you can, you can tell us how well she churns butter, as Pen uh, Videla tells yeah. us. But you get what you grift. You get what you grift. But I mean, yeah. so to, to to back on this though, but I Prude, mean, if you got Theo money, would you take the check? No. Hmm. The inner libertarian in me says no because the moment that someone like that pays you you yeah, lose agency beholden. you lose yeah. agency exactly yeah. i like to think that i would be able to resist some temptation that's just me i would like to say that however if some and i'll, and I'll say it clearly and i'll say it now heaven forbid if someone like the blaze or someone like a, a, a consulting company were to hire me i would probably take the job yes what i try mm. to say is independent as humanly possible also yes but also, as Gio and I are both face fags and we do all that stuff like that, we are limited by nature of showing our faces on how far we can go in some directions. Because oh, yes. there are some real world consequences. And a lot of people aren't sympathetic to that. I hate to say it, but a lot of people very like... Which is fine. I get that. Yeah. 
Um, if Dean but, Kissick know. wanted me to clean up to be an editor of Art Forum, to write for Art Forum, I'd probably do it. <laughs> you know? uh, Dean Kissick, give me a job, please. Please, Dean Kissick. Review my book when it comes out, Dean Kissick, please. Mwah. I would love that. Dean Kissick many, reviewed my book. When it comes many, out. many such cases. Okay. Uh, but uh, <laughs> let's move on. But, 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 no, but the, listen, Brad, I want a long tangent. It's because I don't want people to accuse me and you of bias or, or to say that like the E right is like this perfect morally pure thing. And there's not like any network money or whatever. Um, but people do go too far with the network thing. But yeah, King pill. Yeah. King pill has been doing a lot of work um, researching this. I don't know if he's people. on the payroll and I, and I'm not going to make any accusation unless I have credible evidence. Yeah. I think that what he has done, and this is the thing about elite theory is, is I get it. Rulers do rule. There yeah. are circulations of things that might want to try and change course and direction. The, the circulation of elites probably just means that we have less uh, woke libtards still running things. Let's yeah. not kid ourselves. Like, America is still fundamentally pretty. I mean, I know the whole European-American comparison is very different. But for the purposes of American politics, we're pretty liberal. Like, we, we really are. Even our, even our Republicans are liberal because we're so used to... Um, like, the right is so used to losing... You have Republicans, you know, 10 years after fucking um, Obergefell v. Hodges voting to enshrine gay marriage, marriage, as uh, a federally protected class. Mm -hmm. Like, that's that's the point, you know. Um, and that, that's unfortunately the world that we're in, is the beautiful loser syndrome cements previous victories. And as Basil likes to say, you 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 critique the excess you reify the premise. Yes. And so at least in this debate that we're talking about, one of the things about premises that I think Yarvin is correct on is your measurement of victory. 100%. And that is something that is a hundred percent agreeable to, because to go back against, uh, let, let, let's go back to days of rage, which is a book. Everyone in, in this chat needs to read, do it, do it, do it. By all means, read, read Days of Rage. But you look at the Weather Underground, you look at the Black Liberation Front, you read the Black Panthers and their, mm -hmm. their manifestos, their threats to society. And what do these people want? You know, a lot of the, you know, reforms and things that they want outside of abolishing prison, which we're kind of getting close to in some of these left states. Oh, God. And uh, the, you know, basically the destruction of all private education and you know sort of like white american spaces they got what they wanted in the last 55 years these yeah. people got what they wanted so you had bombings stabbings kidnappings violent protests against even government quebec officials. they had that <clears throat> yeah and so you know we we had and also in the 1910s and 20s we had this too i mean i'm sorry i don't want to believe that uh, the stuff that happened in Harlan County was true because they're like, oh, well, G.H. Blair's a thug. Well, G.H. Blair also said that a bunch of you guys were fucking communists. And I'm more inclined to believe G.H. Blair just because of how American history As much is. as I got to stick up for my fellow Italians, those two guys were communists. Yeah. So, I mean. Or were they names Poo um, Vincet, Vincetti or. Vincetti and. Uh, they were communists, weren't they? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the Vincetti gang, right? No, that's something else. Uh, anyways, I'm thinking about fucking um, something else. Sacco and Vanzetti, thank you. Yeah, Sacco and Vanzetti, yeah. Yes, they yeah. were. But anyways, I mean, the, the realm of victory is something to consider because in this whole discussion, everyone seems to forget about where the thumb on the scale is in this entire discussion. Yes. Darwin is right to criticize the whole, what is your measurement for victory? What is your vision for victory? Because if not, you're a grifter. Very good criticism i think mm -hmm. because I, I i want a vision for what victory is supposed to look like i thought they're supposed to be anarchists anarchists communists socialists they're kind of the same <laughs> they're all in the same fucking bag. they're not the same okay I, I i am a theory solved to the point where they're i would say that ideologically they're driven by different things there's the debate between utopian socialists and communists proper but i think they still come from the same political ecosystem uh they just have different you know methods and ideas um not to say they're all the same, but yeah, if you're an anarchist, communism is not that far away. You know what I mean? So, yeah, no, I get that. Yeah. Um, 
you know, I mouth them as they come out of his mouth. What's the longest monarch- monarchical corporation, the New York Times, the, yeah, the New York Times. But I mean, like, again, you, you need to be looking at the where the thumb on the scale is. Oh, you know, well, discrimination against whites is illegal. It's called the Civil Rights Act. OK, no one enforces the laws in the books right. and everyone knows that there is a specific premise here. And this is where I think you are, where Rufo pushes back is correct. That saying, listen, you need a you need a, a historical narrative to people to latch on to. Yeah. People are not completely objectivist or, well, I mean, outside of some small groups, most people are not like complete hereditary and determinists. They're not total objectivists. I mean, most people are somewhere on the spectrum of, I need, I need, I need a, as, as Mosk and Pareto would tell us, I need a political formula that sells me on a specific historical vision that can go us down mm-hmm. there. Uh, for Alex Jones, that's 1776 will commence again. Um, for for Chris Rufo, that's trying to go back to a time where America flourished. Now, the problem with all of this is, is that I don't think either of these two gentlemen have the world's best political fucking formula to work off of. I don't. Right. I, I don't think so. And yeah, I mean, historical analysis is what Yarvin means by religion. Yes, because Yarvin doesn't really have any beliefs outside of holding on to, I think, some ethno-narcissist claims about his family. And basically that he grew up seeing what American empire looked like at the top of its game. Because America, he grew up with his dad being a foreign service officer. Yeah. Um, and conservatives aren't all moderate because they're forced to be. That's also true. But also you would start freaking the hell out of a lot of people that used to call themselves Republicans. Uh, the moment you started further pushing people further to the right, I want to, you know, Trump's like, okay, like we're going to deport them. Uh, they're sending over, you know, gangs, criminals, rapists. Some of them, I assume, are good people. And everyone's up in arms because all of a sudden that veil of civility that is American political discourse, i.e., the Overton window, which is real, by the way. Yeah. Um, you can't always get what you want. I, uh, mm-hmm. I understand that, Langton. But I also understand that in order to get anything that I want, is going to require a better narrative than simply saying, well, we can go back to something better. It's going to require some sensible centrist pragmatism that isn't conservative pragmatism of like, just give up and let the left take victories left and right, but yet take a little small victory here and there. There's going to have to be a way that cuts through discourse, which I think, you know, when it comes to what Chris Rufo is doing, I mean, obviously there is positives to what he's doing. I think his ideological assumptions are not there. And I do think that Curtis Yarvin gets the picture overall better. But I think that, you know, what's funny, though, is that T777, his father, was involved in government. And he's yeah. like the total opposite picture of Curtis Yarvin, right? So um, it's very funny how that works out. But uh, but we're getting ahead of ourselves. What, what does Curtis Yarvin, because I'm not very well read in this part of American history in terms of the... Uh, formulation of the constitution everything what does curtis yarvin mean by not samuel adams but john adams the john uh let's go to the john adams his cousin his distant cousin yeah well john and sam adams had a debate a while back what is have you read that debate uh i have not um which is something i i I do know a lot about how the constitutional uh convention came about and the constitutional convention itself and its ratification if you want a good book on it um I would recommend um this one isn't half bad. I mean it's kind of liberal, but I mean uh Pauline Myers uh ratification of the people's debate of the constitution. I don't know if you can see that on screen very well. Um mm-hmm. I'd recommend this one. This one isn't half bad. Uh which would basically go out of that way. Um, pragmatism, of course, is certainly necessary in that respect. I would agree with that but, wholeheartedly. What does he mean by Sam, by John Adams being the conservative, whereas Sam Adams is to the left of him? Um, uh, because Sam Adams is a revolutionary. I mean, this, yeah. this is the argument. Uh, you don't even need the historical context for, to get his claim. His claim is, is that look, <clears throat> to destroy the status quo or to be a quote unquote counter revolutionary, which I mean, really for all intents and purposes is, is revolutionary. What is the yeah. co- what is the public hem- hegemonic power of American politics today? It is the left. Mm-hmm. the The left is a the, t- uh, the an, kingmaker is the kingmaker. the The mm-hmm. left is the king, right? And so they are the hegemonic power. And I have an essay on this issue called "The Hegemon and the Revisionist." Is is that 
if if progressivism is the hegemonic state, it is mm-hmm. the hegemonic position on the West, then that makes the revisionist state, the ones trying to change the status quo of the international order or whatever, is the sort of like dissident movements or whatever. Yeah. Okay. So the question now, that kind of puts you in an awkward position because if you're a right winger and you're called a conservative or whatever, obviously you don't want to conserve anything. You kind of want to destroy everything, right? Yeah. You know? And so the last... This is where right-wing postmodernism comes in, by the way. Well, yeah. And this is where James Lindsay gets really upset, but who gives a shit? Um, James Lindsay doesn't know who John the Apostle is, so I really don't care. Oh, boy. Um, Can you highlight God's dominatrix comment here? Yeah, uh, the storyteller's one. New American religion. Um, I'd have to destroy the Abrahamic religions, render them to the status of the primitive new myths or bust. Well, I think there was that impetus in a lot of people of the certain there, founding fathers. Certainly, they were. Well, deists yeah, I mean, the, yeah. the the deists and the anti clericalists. I mean, that was all there. Yeah. Uh, no, but also I think that with with America, especially between like Catholicism and Protestantism and all that, I think that. Uh, as much as religious debates don't really animate people the way that racial debates do. I mean, certain people are correct in that, but I do think that there still is something with America. Like I talked about this with Zanti, actually something very primitive in terms of very, something very ancient, but very new is in America when it comes to the spirit, the metaphysics of America. And I think that a lot of the founding fathers that were DS, like, you know, even Jefferson, they realized that like the old world Christianity doesn't really work in this new context. I remember back in the day when I was writing for Thermidor, we, in in the Slack chat, we would have these debates all the time where we would talk about how, um, really like any like sort of trad orthodoxy or trad Catholicism in American soil can't really flourish the way that people think because of it. But I, I do think that America in some ways was trying to create sort of like a weirdo new civic religion but now that that civic religion has become dominated by the political left, yeah, Owen Cyclops talks about this, yeah. But now that that political civic religion is overwhelmingly dominated by the left, you do have a new form of primitivism, you do have a new form of mythology, but now it's something very ancient that's being appropriated by the global south, it's being appropriated by what's in America indigenously, and the indigeneity of it. And it's like this very weirdo mishmash, almost quasi-new ageism, but yet you do have secular, like new atheist types. But now that you have like Gen Z or leftoids, they're very like mythological in their thinking in a lot of different ways. A lot of it boils down to just ethno narcissism as well. But I do notice that there is a religious turn as both the left and the right are trying to recapitulate this new faith of what America will shape up into. This sort of new faith of America that's coming into being. I am going to do the Johnny Weaver. This new faith coming into being. We're getting rid of the old gods, the old econotypes, and this new faith of primitivism meeting a hyper modern type of religiosity is meshing together in the center. And the left and the right are fighting over the parameters of what that new American faith will shape into. Are you there, Prude? Yeah, no, I was just taking, uh, it was that time of night for me where I have to take uh, anti-rejection medication. So I was okay. just doing that. Yeah. <laughs> or else, but, I mean, or else other, your, other... your kidney's going to pop out like alien. Just <laughs> Sure. Uh, let, let's tell the audience that's what happens when rejection happens. <laughs> uh, kidding. There's no, please do not label medical misinformation in this stream. We're kidding. Oh, I see early Americans as pirates. I would highly recommend that you go read our friend Clossington's entire novella length substack post on the ogc mm-hmm. uh, about pirate culture oh, by the way and all that jazz no Highly that's a great point prude that's a great point by the way for for you sports ball fans i'm hearing my old man yelling and apparently boston bruins won and now the leafs have lost so apparently the leafs and the boston bruins are gonna face each other in the playoffs many such cases that's good you, prude do you know what year the last year the Leafs beat the Boston Bruins in a playoff round? No, I don't, G. 1956. I'm not a not a hockey guy. There I'm a baseball go. guy. <laughs> it's the mid-50s was the last time the Leafs Leafs beat the Boston Bruins in the playoffs. Sports, eh? Yeah, I know. We all have It's our... a curse, man. It's a curse. Anyways, it's let's Canadian. Cut up some slack. Yeah. Um... So, Austin Matthews did not score his 70 goal tonight, apparently. But anyways, well. Oh, that's unfortunate. 
No, really, but so this... this debate, like the problem with this debate, uh, apparently Prude also you, you gave a faulty link, but uh, oh, weird. It's for a four. That's the link I have on screen. Wow, weird. Uh, they 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 didn't wipe it, so um. No, because I I just put the link in on my page and it. Uh, yeah, yeah, it should be there. It should be there, Asinius. Um, there. No, so I think that um. Uh, the problem is that basically they're fighting over. Hello, John D. They're oh, fighting over this new faith of America, and you have to combat things in strictly metaphysical terms. Of course, a lot of people, even people in the E-right, don't even want to talk about this anymore because apparently it's cringe to talk about faith nowadays. You have to like explicitly talk about, uh, you know, other things. But no, but I do think that it really is something. But then again, I don't know. I mean, you're an Orthodox and I'm a tradcast, so we have to believe that our churches are going to survive in the future, obviously. But I, oh, do, I mean, I, I, yeah. I've told them, I've already said flat out, unless the church Americanizes, it's dead. Yeah. Um, yeah. But uh, ne neither here nor there. I think that the, f whatever comes out of America, religiously speaking, um, will be some mix of syncretism and some other weird shit. Uh, maybe just moral, more uh, therapeutic, mo uh, moral therapeutic deism. Which yes. is already sort of what America believes in. A lot of black churches have that, by the way, but it's it's they have a lot of like there's a new age bent to a lot of black churches. Yeah, yeah. America. But I mean, yeah. Uh, the leap of faith past first principles. I mean, to some extent, right? I mean, the question is, can you hold on to your faith uh, whilst doing it? I mean, I think we're headed towards neo feudalism. I mean, yeah, mm -hmm. that'll That's definitely true. be the case. I mean, wealthy, aristocratic. Well, I don't even want to say aristocratic, but wealthy families that basically hold control over areas. I mean, they're like what eight families that more or less run California. Influencers uh, be, are like cults now. Yeah. To some extent. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but, but that's really America is a cultic and occultic machine. America has created cults. America has created secret societies. America has, is, it's not going anywhere. No, that, that that's no. part of the country that is all built yeah. in. People like but, Whitney Webb are very good at this. Like the very, you know, people, even Jay Dyer. I know a lot of people don't like Jay Dyer, but like he's, he's very good at that I too like as Jay well. Dyer. I know you don't like Jay Dyer, but um, yeah. <laughs> no, but he's good at this. Like, I think he stretches the history a bit a lot, but I do think that America, for some reason, there is something within the American soil that is a breeding ground of new cults, a breeding ground of new religiosities and a meshing together of all econotypes. I talk a little about this in my book, by the way. Uh, and I, of course, I credit one man. I know, listen, I know, I know, I know that he has problems. I know. But John David Ebert, Art After Metaphysics, uh, he goes into it. And I think you can create a lot of connections there with how the work of art has been influenced by America, uh, religiosity in America. But... I know it's straying from the topic of Yarvin v. Rufo. Yeah, we're, we're, we're going on a tangent as well. No, but it's connected together because I do think Curtis Yarvin realizes this. It's just that he prefers to be secular and rootless and blah, blah, blah. So it's just, it's because Yarvin, he comes from that class. You know, you can't like, listen, to quote Ricky, a shit leopard can't change the shit spots. You know what I mean? Like it's, and he admits it, you know, like Yarvin is a secular cosmopolitan guy. Like he's a world citizen. But I, I, I listen, you know, as much as I bash Curtis Yarvin and I make a point of it, if if Curtis Yarvin was staring at me through that camera, I probably would have a good conversation with him. I'm not going to lie to you. I'd probably be like, listen, I know I talked a lot of shit about you, but uh, well, I know I know you talk a lot of shit about me, Joe, but uh, well, you know, uh, back in the day, you see, uh, John Adams was a real uh, trad, uh, trad conservative. And um, <laughs> anyways, uh, I've been talking a lot. You go prove. So you, what would you, what did you take out of this debate that you wanted to, you want to move on to the second where, where Rufo retorts him or, uh, well, I mean, it's, I'm at, I'm at the conclusion here. I mean, people, I'll, I'll have it linked in the description after the yeah, stream, okay. yeah, yeah. but just, <clears throat> you know, in your opening statement, you admit quote, I complain, but I do not know of for now a better way. This is the most honest thing you've said here in a summary self indictment. Instead of meeting the challenge and hardship of responsibility, you comfort yourself with the dictum that history's losers are usually right. Like a sullen teenager who insists that everything's pointless because he doesn't want to make an effort. 
I have a different attitude. Some things are rotten in our Republic. Yes, but there's always nobility and constructive action. My work is not only shifted perceptions, but shifted the direct experience of the world for many people. And I'm committed to make sure that that continues to do so. I don't know what you're committed to. And sadly, I don't think you do either. Ultimately, we offer two paths. Our readers must decide, step into the opium den with Curtis Garvin or into the arena with other men. Uh, and of course, there's been a lot of back and forth on the underpinning of masculinity. Um, whether whether it's Curtis calling him a Norwood one at 40 years old uh, or having a, a childhood uh, historical understanding and uh, Rufo on Twitter basically saying that he's like a just dickless and not very masculine and... But and and believe in using other sexual metaphors like being the guy that goes to a bdsm club being whipped saying he's the big man and it's just like i get it everyone's got their no but see prove this is what i don't like about this shit it's just, it's just a fucking serious debate like it's oh i know it's because it's, it's a fucking dick point. measuring contest you know what i mean like well, they're yeah. talking about serious well, issues that affect the political right and like, and, and they're, you're both trying to have this bro off about like, oh, I have a bigger dick because I fuck art hoes. I have a bigger dick because I'm a trad man that has a family and I'm married to an Asian wife. It's like, fuck off, man. Like it's, it's both these guys come out. I think both of them came out worse than when they went into It was thing. pretty, no, I agree with you wholeheartedly. Like yeah. all of this passive aggressive, petty back and forth. And I mean, at the end of the day, you, there, there are, there are two things that you can look at. One who has provided sort of a conceptualized framework to look at the world, which has a flawed model, yeah. albeit he is one man out of many other quote unquote neo reactionary thinkers. Uh, another who, to me, is funded by wealthy New Yorkers and is going after um, what I would argue like, I mean, like, what, what has he been doing today? All day he has been quote tweeting the new CEO of National Public Radio. And her shitty libtard tweets from like 2018, 2019, 2020. And it's like, oh, wait, how... prove, prove, prove. Oh, 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 back oh. up, back up, back up. Prove, 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 back up. You mean to tell me the head of National Public Radio is yes, a libtard woman? Yeah, I know. And I get it. I get it. There was. <laughs> Sweet, I... Sweet Jack be doing that. <laughs> I know. And I get it. And I get it. There was, what? and I'll, I'll, I'll stop sharing. I know that there was a whistleblower that came out and basically just said, here's all the libtard things NPR does. I'm going to get soy jacked. So look with the feds, with the feds. <laughs> However, and I get it, right? Like I listened, I listened to NPR. Like I would listen oh, to NPR. NPR saw some good stuff. Yeah. Well, sure. since car talk died, we're really, what's the fucking point? However, mm. I would listen to Sean Hannity uh, on my way to certain classes in college. And I would listen to NPR after class. And that was my like that was my way with uh oh. balancing opinions. And I have a deep love for um Rush Limbaugh. However, um that yeah, that doesn't make me people uh, a purple Caesarist for liking Yarvin entertaining and interesting. Um yeah, get 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 Worski to moderate this shit. I would actually pay good money to watch Andy you know Worski try moderate? and moderate Chris Rufo on the air with Curtis Yarvin the other way. Um, Imagine no PPP way. trying to rip into Yarvin. That'd be funny. <laughs> no way, Lewis. Yeah, I know. I know. It's it's funny. But anyways, so uh, I, I think that the problem, however, is, is that at the end of all of this, despite their whole snippety kayfabe back and forth, this is that you have two people that are trying are looking at the elephant in two different ways. Mm -hmm. One of them is looking at the world and what can I actually do? and trying to get elites on my side to try and correct things. Now, and this is not to say that Rufo has not prescribed different ideas when it comes to, say, uh, Griggs and parts of freedom of association. And everyone's like, listen, even if you got, if, even if you brought back freedom of association, 95% of America would more or less be the same. And maybe like yeah. five, like five percenters, right. Uh, that would basically just be trying to do racist like businesses or whatever. Okay, so be it. Whites right, only gym or whatever, yeah. Which you kind of, well, theoretically you could. I mean, people were already trying to do this already with like the whole. Oh, you'll get firebombed by Antifa probably. But well, like, sure. You know, but I mean, you know. like in the same way that, uh, you know, you, you can make rules that say no, no hip hop, pants must be pulled up. Or no cameras playing, in the gym. Or people playing uh, classical music outside 7-Elevens, right? Uh, to get rid of certain populations. Uh, so now with that being said, he's also got things that clearly to me sound kind of gatekeepy oh, yeah. or 
Well, I mean, outright, like, listen, guys, I don't like the politics of whiteness or whatever. Or by that, he means he doesn't want white identitarianism to be sort of this, like, prominent political movement in the United States. Who, Yarvin or Rufo? Rufo. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I already know what Yarvin's position is on this. He's not a wig nat, but he isn't unsympathetic to it. And he's already said who he's who he's for in this position. Um, however, uh, and I mean, this is funny because I'm also talking about uh, only allowed to talk like Sephiroth on the premises. <laughs> <laughs> God, that's Sephiroth. Sephiroth. Can you talk like that? Um, but Did anyways. you throw in some Ebonics? <laughs> no. Uh, it's shockingly hard to avoid Ebonics, though, I must the, say, the, in common parlance. Yeah. The, 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 Greer, the Greer head pledge is great. Um, mm. But anyways, to get back onto this, I think that it's sort of important to consider that while, you know, despite maybe recent essays by former old heads saying that maybe certain parts of politics 10 years ago have eventually won rhetorically, mm-hmm. I don't think that's the case because the the legal infrastructure for dei is not going away no you you, you can fire consultants or whatever or you can fire and do layoffs because the economy is going into the shitter that's true well the The legal infrastructure the legal infrastructure that has made america as anti-white and as leftist as it is is not going anywhere it is enshrined by jurisprudence and law and unless you're willing to get rid of that either by firing these people ignoring them blatantly doing nullification <laughs> agenda 2025 <laughs> 2025 baby you know like hey I, I i signed up for it full disclosure i applied i'm taking the classes well, but the thing is like full is disclosure it... i no, look but... forward to, to serving in the, the the trump second term and some there you go under secretary position i look forward to it i doubt that they'll hire me but hey no but what's uh, so radical about this saying that like if a political party wins you want to staff an administration with people that are sympathetic to that ideology or agenda like the left is so used to getting w's that they literally demonize other people saying you know what when we win we're gonna put our guys in charge that's just politics it's like that's just politics in general and that's what conservatives they do that you know like even today i saw this conservative i quote tweeted saying about like the right wing they just want cancel culture they they were just uncomfortable with who got canceled yeah 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 I want to reward my friends and punish my enemies. Oh my god! Like you know, this is the thing about the whole. Yeah. This is the this is the, the, the whole scalping discourse over it too. It's like he did get somebody you know, symbolically fired, right? Like Claudine yeah. Gay still works at fucking Harvard, right? Yeah. She you still know? makes what nine hundred grand a year? Yeah, she makes close to a million bucks. Yeah. Great. You know. Uh. So with that being said, Claudine Gay right? will make a lot more. And because Claudine she's Gay going will, to go on the book tour. I was about to say, Claudine Gay is going to go on the podcast and book tour very soon, I imagine. And she'll yeah. tell her story. And it'll well, be about Chris black Rufo voices. is an evil Nazi. Yeah. And, and how it's so important that black voices are in education. But I mean, basically, what has Chris Rufo done is, is that I'm, I'm waiting. I'm waiting for them to change um, the definition of plagiarism to where it oh, only they affects will. white people. They will. They it's will. only a matter of time. No, but basically also, everyone's like, oh, wow, all these diversity hires are literally not qualified for the job. Like, yes, we know this already. Thank you for saying the obvious. It's it's just, it's frustrating because, again, at the end of the day, the political vision does have to include some kind of narrative. And I get it. Both of these guys have an interesting opinion on FDR, where I think he's kind of like being rehabbed on the right to some extent, which I'm mm-hmm. okay with, on the fact that, like, the guy was effective administrator. I mean... Well, his policies are still there to this day. <laughs> his policies are still here to this day. Like the, the the old right of the 1920s and 30s and 40s could never, ever, um, they never they never got rid of it. Reagan ran on getting rid of it. Never happened. Reagan never got rid of Roe versus Wade. Reagan never got rid of Roe versus Wade. Never got um, rid of Immigration Act or whatever. No. I would argue that um, LBJ was the last American king. Hmm. Um, yeah, I would argue. I would argue LBJ was the last American. If you believe he was involved with Kennedy assassination, then yeah, he probably was. Well, even regardless of what you think about fucking Kennedy's assassination, yeah, LBJ basically just swung his dick into literally sometimes into getting what he wanted. Albeit his one mistake, of course, was the Vietnam War. Which, oh yeah. I mean, really, um, that's a whole other story. But I mean, on the domestic side of things, and I mean, L- and a lot of LBJ stuff got continued by Nixon. I mm-hmm. mean, fucking Patrick Daniel Moynihan, right? You know, uh, famous for getting a lot of the things out of um, Nixon's LBJ. Advent. 
literally was signed into power by the widow of the of his president that still had blood on her blouse. Remember this. That's the king move right there. You know what I mean? Like that your conquered widow signs you into power after you've, you know, oh my God, the symbol the helicopter had to get their cheese. Very true. Yeah. But anyway, so like the, the yeah. great society 2.0 of FDR, if not greater, because now you're addressing the race stuff. Yeah. And now you're creating entirely new institutions that are going to destroy the centers of power to your enemies, well, to your enemies, which is a lot of like white, you know, not so, well, yeah. not just that, but I mean, like, I mean, even if you buy into say EMJ stuff on like the slaughter of the cities, mm -hmm. like a lot of European Catholic, you know, groups that were not happy with this, got eviscerated, right. Mm -hmm. Race war in high school written by like, is Saltzman like a Jewish guy? It doesn't matter. Yeah. yeah. But like, I mean, still you read those texts and you like, look at it and you see how a lot of this shit is top down. Mm -hmm. And uh, all, all, well, of all sudden, the civil rights movement was basically top down. That's like a whole mythology that it was like some wholesome chungus. Well, I mean, that, that was the, that is yeah. the greatest. If we're going to talk about, talk about political narratives, I mean, for fuck's sake, the death, the, the myth that the 1960s brought to America that killed the right more than anything. Yeah. Um, on the whole conversation about activism, right? The 1960s and the days of rage and that came in the 70s made people believe that protesting and nonviolent protests was the way to achieve political change in America. <laughs> political change in America came by violence, terrorism, and people activating the National Guard and threatening white people with fucking bayonets, saying you can't have what you had to begin with, which were your, your own spaces. Mm -hmm. And so for years, we have believed in this myth where conservatives have formalized these mythologies this is why can Republicans suck off MLK every fucking January or February, the, the, whatever his day the is. The McNaughton painting of MLK with the MAGA hat. Yeah. Right? Or all the AI images of, you know, Trump and MLK. <laughs> together, funny, Widow funny. Conquer, Groiper. <laughs> and so, because, and this is why the history thing was so frustrating. They focused on the revolution, uh, the American independence war. Focus on the fucking 60s. Everyone knows that that's where it starts. Well, it doesn't really mm -hmm. start there. But everyone knows that we can historically identify 60 some odd years ago, we radically went in the wrong direction. And then it was formalized in the 70s by violence, terrorism, and basically all those terrorists are college professors or were given were sinecures, pardoned by Bill Clinton, or were pardoned by Bill Clinton. And Angela Davis still talks to colleges. Okay. And Bill Ayers mentored uh, Obama. And it's not that my voice is breaking, it's that I'm sick. I've been sick for like two weeks. I have no voice at all. This is what happens when you nuke your immune system. Yeah, yeah and then you get sick or whatever, and then it takes forever to recover. No, like, but, like, been... no but like, I remember, do you remember when Obama, he had this line when people like Rush Limbaugh were going after him about Bill Anyone Ayers? over 50 does, absolutely doesn't think this way. I know. And that's that's, this is why rufo is doing what he does yeah because rufo knows that the people with money power and connections and infrastructure are all over 50 years old yep and this is the big gap in all of this discourse because yarvin's an overly online blogger and shit poster right like he doesn't have to he wants to be buy in. well he doesn't have to buy into this narrative right like he doesn't mm -hmm. have to be the old 50s you know 50 year old plus i mean he is over 50 but i mean he doesn't buy into these narratives Whereas most normie conservatives, you know, my heckin' wholesome like melting pot, we're all Americans idea, yeah. all that stuff is there, is um all here. And that's unfortunately a big consequence of the uh, these mythopoetics. And so at the end of the day, right? <laughs> like that's the consequence. How fucking dare you say that? <laughs> yeah. Well, I know that's why I got the little timeout for being <laughs> And, um, so, but I mean, that, that's where we're at. And so again, uh, no, no, I but can't... I think like, you know, what I don't understand is that a lot of leftoids nowadays, they have this like performative hatred of liberals where they'll look to liberals and are like, yo, you're all, you're going to side with fascism, bro. You're enable fascism. But every, at every turn, the quote unquote centrist liberals on the left, they say that like threatening common people, 
with certain policies of the civil rights movement that that was justified because they were evil racists and so it's like where where is the liberal enabling okay, but, the quote-unquote but, but, fascist but, but 60 years ago right that ev everyone was a fucking racist right like i mean oh, all of society was racist by today's standards yeah yeah sure Even liberal right, which is why which is why i i disagree with like the progressive notion of presentism the eternal now means that yeah. everyone was a bigot at all times and we must correct ourselves so in the future there there are no bigots but all of our, our, our and our ideas about the future are about the problems of now because apparently these right. things are never solved why because the left still operates in the framework of perpetual revolution um well no but prude i will say though that there is a there is um for the past hundred years there has been i mean maybe past thousand years there has been like a culmination of what we consider the modern progressive left. I mean, people say like, I know uh, Geoward Griffin, he talks about like monetary policy and like uh, the creatures from Jekyll Island and the, the federal reserve, blah, blah, blah. But also people talk about like certain areas of like certain occultic schools in Europe and so forth in the 19th century. But when you talk about like real world, like how America has been shaped today, I mean, the, the so like the sixties were kind of like a nuclear bomb that went off in the heart of America. And like, even Yarvin said, like if the founding fathers came back today, they'd be like, you know what? King George wasn't that bad. <laughs> you, know? King, you know, King Henry wasn't that bad. <laughs> you know, like, fuck. <laughs> so I think Yarvin is correct about that, but like who put in the chat, uh, monochrome hysteria, Yarvin's a theory. So Rufo's an activist. So they end up talking over each other. Yeah, of course. hundred percent. No, I mean, every, I, every, what, Yeah every time no that's why and I, I, and I mean I, it, I, yeah. and this is why like um i mean to some extent you and i kind of talk past each other not because uh, I, I don't theory sell on things but also like i work in government like i you yeah, know, yeah like true I, I, there's there's a structural issue that clashes with theory well, yeah but i think the problem with rufo is that he seized on a very temporary condition of intra-racial intra-religious conflict so yeah. what do I mean by that? A lot of those old boomers like that, that of, are of, you know, this religion, they, they or ethnicity, whatever. They're not going to be around for longer because the younger cohort of, of Jewish people in America, they don't have the same like affinity towards Israel that Bill Ackman does. And they oftentimes, a lot of them will side with progressive activists. And so Rufo is coming in saying like, Oh, see, don't you know that they hate Israel, that they hate us, they hate Israel. And and so therefore, like Claudine Gay, she also sides with the Palestinian wholesome chungus activists, right? But that dynamic isn't going to exist when the boomers in the, ne in the next 20 years, because the boomers are going to go away. And a lot of the younger people, they on the political left, not just Jewish people, but I mean like on the political left in general, they're gonna side with Palestine regardless. And it's like, you know, I, I just think that. Rufo seized a very temporary situation and that's how he got that symbolic W. But the problem is like you said, Prude, they're just going to change the standards. I think I said that too a while months ago, but they're just going to change the plagiarism standards and they're going to wise up to Rufo's game and you know, people in Florida that like Rufo mm -hmm. and it's like, they're just going to have to fight the battle all over again because it's not the dynamics going to change younger zoomer political activists on the left. They don't, I mean, okay, here's what's going to happen. Okay. I, I said this a few months ago when Rufo did this thing with Claudine Gay, the political left, the activist core of Antifa, they're going to swoop in and they're going to say that, okay, we all agree that anti-Semitism is bad, right? So we're going to ensure that cultural anti-Semitism is a no-no. But we're going to say, but criticizing Israel, though, that's different, right? And they do this all the time. They do this all the time. Because a lot of the conservative people that are pro-Israel on the right wing, not the right wing, on the conservative like Fox News people, they also say things like, if you criticize Israel, if you criticize what Israel is doing, that you're an anti-Semite, like Ben Shapiro types, right? So what's going to happen is, they will ensure that all of their ducks are in a row. You can't be, you can't criticize any demographic on the political left, right? Including anti-Semitism. But they'll still give you an outlet to criticize the actions of Israel because Israel's run by a right-wing government. Israel's run by settler colonialism. And so Rufo's position of exploiting that conflict, it's not going to be around anytime soon. 
So he's not going to have the same meaningful victory if you have an anti-Israeli head of a university that's siding with pro-Palestinian activists. It's not going to work because they're just going to change up the game, right? Because they're going to say that, you know, we totally condemn anti-Semitism, but we're not, but we're not going to condemn pro-Palestinian. We saw this too. Yeah. We yeah. saw this too with like the whole stop AAPI hate, like the Asian yes. Pacific Islander stuff. Yeah. Because like yeah. it did not matter. And the NYPD every day would show a photo or a footage of some black guy beating the shit out of an Asian woman. Like, right. what did the pop culture tell us? It was a white guy's fault. Uh, the whole Batman movie that or came out Or somehow it was ago. whiteness's fault, like, in general. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And it's st structural whiteness or whatever. And yeah. so, but, like, now, you know, as much as the stuff in it does affect American politics, and it will, I mean, we saw this with Biden. We saw this with the whole Iran discussion. And that's a whole other debate to get into for another day. Oh, but, yeah, the Iran thing, yeah. Yeah, I mean, the thing to also consider is that, um, it, you know, even blue cities are like, well, we can't take these immigrants, right? Like immigration mm -hmm. is still the most number one unprompted issue that voters bring up. Yeah. This, you know, like this is going to be a domestic focused election. Yeah. And I think that if Rufo wants to be successful and Rufo should be spending his energy on getting Trump elected. Yes. I think that so again that that would be my criticism like if you're if you're going to be an activist your activism needs to be ensuring what Yarvin says opening room for more victory your activism yeah. needs to lead to a trump victory cuz he's not going to change some kind of universities he's not going to do that he's not leaving impossible. florida i don't see him leaving florida right. do i see him well apart from florida on, like, i mean in general advice? i mean in general. well i mean do, just do i see him taking on a role say in like the department of education under a republican admin yeah even, yeah. as, even as an advisor, even as an advisor, um, yeah. the problem is, and this goes back to uh, what God's dominatrix comment earlier. It's just like, listen, you have to legitimize and just say it's okay to be discriminatory. Because yeah. I mean, like, there's only there's only one group in America that doesn't that isn't allowed to do that, and it's the one that everyone else shits on. And this is going to probably be the least media attention focused election. Um, all the election stuff that I see that gets talked about is about the Trump trials. It's not about battleground <sighs> states. Trump's not on Twitter. This election will get the least media coverage because the, the media knows, the regime knows, the more we let Trump speak, the more he gets airtime. Yeah. And so <clears throat> it's, dude, I've been coughing and post-nasal trip. My voice just sucks. It ain't the time well, no, but uh, well, what's the specific Trump trial? It's a criminal trial rather than a civic trial. What, what's this? The I, I'm not up to date on this. this. Is the hush money case. Oh my God, that case. <laughs> yeah, so this was jury selection for the hush money uh, case. Who they got cares, seven jurors selection selected, and so they're going to see all the tabloids. They're going to see all of the Access Hollywood transcript or whatever. Well, the so, Canadian yeah. media, they're salivating over this. The CBC called this historic trial of, uh, you know, president. So, well, I mean, so <clears throat> this is, there's an essay in, I think we covered it on the Xeno Systems episode, literally mm -hmm. called Discrimination, where Nick Land is like, you should be able to do this. Yeah. So, yeah, no, I, I agree with this. This is the Stormy Daniels case. That was the Hush Money case. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Like, <sighs> Yeah, this is the Stormy Daniel case. Out of all the cases, this is the one that's going to trial. That's incredible, man. That's incredible. That's so, yeah, no, but like, I mean, do you think they could like actually put him in jail during the election? <laughs> that's well, I mean, that's sort of the goal. That's the goal. Yeah, that's the goal. I thought they weren't. I thought they would be more politically savvy than this. But they well, saw I mean, that we, like, we thought. Well, oh look at the yeah, Georgia you're case right. And the Fannie right. Willis thing. Like it does okay. They got Al. Cap I, I mean, I hate to be like normie for a second, but I mean, they got Al Capone on taxes. Like, yeah. yeah. Even if even if the black DA Fannie Willis screwed the pooch on the Georgia case, and mm -hmm. it doesn't look like they're they're still gonna let that case go through. I That's mean, incredible. Would really, that no. Would it would it really upset the regime matrix if if Trump gets got by a fucking sex scandal? No, of course not. No, exactly. So that's no, that. but I, I thought they would try to like quietly contain him by making him uh, like the parameters around the election where he's going to basically lose or whatever. 
But no, they're just going to be like, you know what? We're going to look full bore. We're going to make as a spectacle as much as possible. And we're just going to destroy this guy. And it really, uh, they bar, apparently they barred Trump from going to Baron Trump's graduation ceremony. A court banned a father from going to his child's graduation ceremony because it would cause like some disruption or whatever. That's like insane, man. Like that's, they, we live in such an insane time that I think when you really pull back, I know, listen, I know that's not a content worthy point. I know that may be a cool point, but I think that we do live in such an insane time where they really are petty, this petty and vindictive and people, the media, like the, the, the Chris Matthews of the world, the Rachel Maddows of the world, they're like, they're cooming right now over this. They're like really wetting themselves over the possibility of like a prawn corn star from the nineties, destroying Trump. Like it's, it's uh, you're right. I am giving them too much credit. I am giving them too much credit. Monochrome hysteria. It's uh, Oh my God, man. Like that's no, like, and that I think it really does prove that if you are an enemy of the regime, even at the highest level of politics, the president, of the United States, that they're just going to find ways to go after you. Like that really is such a dangerous precedent. I know, listen, I know that the whole thing is a work anyways, but I do think that when you pull the wool, you pull the, the, the veil over what real political power is. I mean, it's insane. Now, could have Trump have acted better? Could he have done better? Could he have actually dreamed the swamp? I don't, I, don't, he, I do knows, not right? think that Trump had any fucking idea what Pandora's box he opened. No. When he, he, ran. Didn't, he didn't know what he was doing when he went into the zone and he went into the room. You know? He didn't, so, yeah. he didn't no, know. I, he, he, I think he has a clue now. Or at least oh, he's yeah. whispering in his ear that he knows. Plus his yeah. whole livelihood's being destroyed. So like he definitely knows. He's going to be uh, poor after this. The only president in the last 70 years who is poorer for going into office than going out of office. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my God. Yeah, man. Shall we uh, head to the Super Chats? Super Gio? Chats? Yeah. Yeah, let's do that. Well, it looks like the Leafs are going to be playing the Boston Bruins in the play. <laughs> oh, my God. Mm -hmm. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I do appreciate you all tuning in at this new time frame. Thank you for allowing me to still do what I do in that respect, and I uh, I greatly appreciate it. Uh, we will be enjoying the Tuesday night time slot. Um, oh, yeah, he is he is now richer after the Truth Social deal, if I recall correctly. Oh, that's um, right. So the he, truth, well, that's keeping made, him afloat. Yeah. It is. Uh, he's, he's actually pretty fucking wealthy, um, at least on mm. paper. We'll see how it plays out. But anyways, thank you so much for, for tuning all in. We're going to get to the Super Chats now. So if you asked a question or whatever, um, we are going to go ahead and answer them. We'll start with the ones over on Entropy. Uh, the Entropy link is the pinned comment. It's also in the description. Uh, it takes less of a cut than YouTube does, so it's always greatly appreciated. And, of course, you can uh, support Geo and I via Patreon. Subscribe star. Substack is still the best one to do so. And, um, yeah, by all means, let's go get started over on Entropy. All right, so uh, we'll start here. Um, Sam153 sends $10 American. He says, happy $10. Tuesday. Well, happy Tuesday to you. Yes. Uh, Belial Bradley um, uh, also sends $10. He says, Bueno, Gionata. Uh, good evening to you, sir. Um, welcome. Uh, Anonymous Anonymous says, I watched the show Resident Alien. Ham-fisted, libtard messages ruined an otherwise entertaining show. Hmm. I've never heard of the Resident Alien. Yeah, Resident Alien. I don't remember Is it this. like Resident Evil? Oh, it's a 2021... Uh, sci-fi show. Interesting. Oh, I think I've heard of huh. that. <laughs> uh, you, you do make me laugh, God's Dominatrix. I will give you that. Um, Seneca sends $3. He says, can't talk tonight, gents. I've got things to do at home. And I joined the choir at my local church practices tonight. I'll have you guys on the background as I do chores. Uh, he then says, uh, here's the Missouri lore update. Came across discovered by the Marquette Joliet expedition as a massive mural painted outside Alton, Illinois, Thunderbird like a creature that was violent and dangerous. What's well, it called? I do appreciate uh, the um, Piazza bird P I A S A. Um, I'm going to go type that hmm. in. Piazza bird. Interesting. And there is a mural. Huh. 
Kobayashi. Um, Whoa, yeah, and, that's and a cool mural. Yeah, that is pretty wow. cool. I'll push that on screen cool. real quick. I, I appreciate that our friend Seneca shows us uh, lore and things from his uh, his home state. It's that part of the tapestry neat. of Digital Archipelago now. It really is. We we do like that. Wow, look at that. That's amazing. Because remaining a lifelong student is an insult to the teacher. I suppose so, in some respect. <laughs> okay. Uh, carrying on. Um, Owen Stileski sends uh, three yeah, sends three dollars. Says, Hello, gents. Hope you're all well. Um, uh, directing um, with his uh, students went really well. I am a spurg when it comes to AI, so it's annoying being a right-wing artist and seeing people settle for AI for book covers and stuff. God bless. Mm. well yeah you know it's really interesting though like on stream yards it says you can generate your own thumbnail with ai never gonna, i kind of want to i kind of want to click it just to see what a digital archipelago would look like but uh i'm not gonna do it uh owen Zaleski also sends uh he says i really don't like people or i said i really hate how right wingers are counter signaling chuds that are angry um about the um i think this is the whole wife jack stuff uh, any wonder why cons are beautiful losers when we have to concede because of its nerd shit? I would sacrifice a thousand Scott Greers to keep a chud in charge of Games Workshop. Uh, well, I don't know about that one. Oh, the Fem Stodies. Okay, this is the whole 40k stuff. Well, I mean, the 40k stuff is literally oh, just yeah. despite the chuds. I mean, it's yeah. all that it is. It's to, it's despite it's despite the chuds. Yeah. I mean, here, here's the thing. People didn't like 4th edition Warhammer. People didn't like 5th edition. People don't like where fucking D&D is gone. You know what one of the most popular parts of D&D is? It's 3.5 and Pathfinder. And that stuff's been going on for like 20 plus years at this point. It's not like you don't have all the lore. It's not like you don't have all Gen the Gen Xers codexes. that play that. It's not... Well, I, I've played Pathfinder. Mm. I mean, like, it's not like you don't have the old shit to play with you don't have to progress the story i i don't know i i you don't always have to take up your toys and walk away because some libtar takes it mm -hmm. um i just think that you should be able to, en to enjoy what's yours because it's not like again it's like it's like with pathfinder i mean yes it's different because that's not nearly as politicized it is now because you have fucking wheelchair accessible dungeons but i mean i enjoy a lot up. of art and by libtards Fuck. Yeah. Homebrew it up. Gatekeep libtards. Kick out libtards from your game store. Roundhouse kick a libtard outside the 3D print shop. <laughs> 3D print shop. Golly. Uh, non Anonymous also says, I swear Geo talked about it. Maybe I need to double my dosage. Um, so. What, what, talk about what? But he says this in the comments on Entropy. He says, I work many high profile. Um, Houses at my job. You would be surprised to know what a certain cuckold senator's wife has seen griper tweets and agrees. Well, oh! that wouldn't surprise me in the slightest. Um, yes, you're back. Uh, El, you're good. I was giving you shit. Who's he you. referring to? Cucked wife. Oh, well, I wouldn't be surprised considering how gay the Senate is. Anyways, no. uh, on to the uh, YouTube super chats. Uh, Creeper Weirdo says, I discovered a band called Appalachian Anarchy. It's a bluegrass heavy metal band, and I really dig it. Oh, I've heard well, about Well, I will Anarchy. go look up some Appalachian Anarchy For and listen to that on my drive tomorrow. Yeah. Um, oh, I'm, oh, you said I'm not a Spurg when it comes to AI. Okay, well, that's good to know. I apologize. Oh. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, I would rather pay an artist like Geo or Dora or Nullis to do... If I were to write a book, I would want these guys to do my book cover. Yeah, or the know. guy that does all the Terror House ones. Yeah, no, I, yeah, I agree. I forget his name, but yeah. Mike um, something. But I mean, like, we have a whole bunch of guys that do... Like, that's the thing. I'd rather put my money where my mouth is, you know? Like, I pay friends, you know? Like, I... I mean, I you know, I, I give money to, to Skeptical Wave, especially since it got demonetized. I mean, the guy that does... Mm. Yeah, Shimmy. Uh, and the guys who does the double dealer magazine, I mean, like, yeah, use shoot. the tools yeah. properly, but I would rather pay an artist. Um, but also, this is a very, very grateful one, and I'm very, very grateful. Um, but uh, Monster Chief 117 sends a $50, so thank you very for much, sir. For 50 
dollars. <laughs> People expect me to do that, so I, I have to do that. Yeah. There you go. Yeah, absolutely. Whoa, Highly. $50. Thank you. <laughs> Monster Chief 717. Is that like Master Chief, but Monster Chief? Yeah. Nice. Uh, all right. We'll carry on. Um, <clears throat> well, Monochrome, we were talking about this before the show started, but I guess we'll bring it up now. Um, oh, have you guys addressed God. the stupid pro Islam argument being made on the timeline uh, recently? Darkest of, darkest of coal, get it off my timeline. I recall the alt right having this debate or discussion like 10, 12 years ago. Yes, and uh, it Didn't Islam is still a civilizational threat to the West, regardless if you're Christian or pagan or whatever. It's fundamentally incompatible with Western society. Being I mean, pro, being pro Islam to own Zionism or to own the Jews. No, yeah, uh, they still argument. they still need to be deported. <laughs> they still, <laughs> still gotta to go. go back. They still need to go back. I'm they're, sorry, they're they're individual Muslim scholars that I admire, but um, I think that as a civilizational force, there's just too much of a difference there. Now, could you say that there are certain strains of Islam that are anti-modern that may be approaching a perennialist understanding of things? Yeah, of course, but in terms of like saying that there are allies and there are brothers and there's this like Duganist Eurasianism thing. Like, I, I think that that's ways yeah, yeah, no. to be charitable than what Prude has just said. I think that to play devil's advocate for a moment, Prude, sure. I think that the sentiment is, I understand it from certain people that do. I mean, I have certain third, you know, third position proclivities, whatever, but I think that particularly people like Alexander Dugan make way too much of it. And they don't realize that not only is Islam okay hostile to to serve the West, and I don't mean just hostile to like quote unquote Western degeneracy, but I mean hostile to historically what the Western world has. But also, I think it sort of paints a flowery picture of the lived experiences of a lot of Muslims around the world. And it's sort of the same way as saying that Russia is based in Trad or China is based in Trad or whatever. I think the problem is when you put. I understand this because we live in terrible times. We live in a time where uh, the political left is the ascendant kingmaker of the West. But that being said, to paint a flowery picture of these other civilizations is not very prudent. Put it that way. I, I'm not doing this because I'm not. I didn't say the word because it's like a. I mean, it's it, it's not the most pragmatic assessment. Now there are individual Muslims who are certainly sympathetic to the right wing in North America or even in Europe. But I think as a whole, it's just, it's not going to work. But also another argument I saw, which I think is probably the best counter argument to people making this, is that the political right in North America and in Europe, it really isn't in a position to start sorting out friends and enemies the way that people in political power can. It's not like we could just snap our fingers and be like, you know what, we're going to have this grand glorious allyship with the Muslims and it's going to be great. And we're going to like, you know, topple the powers that be. We're going to topple the libs. It's it's not going to work out that way. It's just it's a fundamentally flawed <laughs> argument. But I will say that I have studied quite a bit of people who have either converted to Islam or who are who are um, Islamic scholars. And I think that individual Muslims, of course, uh, you know, I think are worthy and noble of study and, and probably are sympathetic to uh, a lot of people on the political right. But that being said, like as a civilizational force, that is where you get into very murky issues. But we're talking about this from North America. In Europe, I mean, it's way worse. Way, way, way worse. And to just ignore the lived experiences of people in Europe who have been deeply affected by the Muslim migrant crisis is a very, very imprudent thing. And, and I think that, you know, to, respectfully, I disagree with the takes of certain people who have made that argument. And I don't want to, I don't want to criticize people either way. I'm just saying that to sort out like, who's the greater problem and who's this theoretically. Okay, fine, whatever. But I think that in terms of pragmatic politics, the political right is not in a position to do that. I think we're in a survival mode, put it that way. And um, there's a yeah, lot of I, problems I, I, I with think the Islamic you, thing. Yeah. And I mean, again, yeah. A, no, I respectfully disagree with people who make that take. Even Alexander Dugan, I respectfully disagree with him on this point about global Islam. Yeah. And I mean, he, even... <clears throat> God bless. No, even if don't you worry can't... About it. Um, 
even if you can't go towards did we not read your i feel like we did i read it at the beginning with entropy um oh i i totally actually missed it i'm sorry uh yeah scribe uh but i appreciate you sending it via youtube i'll read it real quick thank you um I mean, listen, it's like the whole Abbasiyah thing, too. I mean, that comes from uh, Ibn Khaldun, I mean, a Muslim. Like, there are yeah. certain Islamic political treatises that I think are interesting and worth reading, sure. Well, even Gunyan converted to Islam. <laughs> but, I, <laughs> but I also know, but I also know, for those that have gone to Europe and those that have gone to America, even, even fucking Sam Francis, not Sam Francis, even Sam Huntington was like, listen, this is a civilizational clash historically both i mean both christian and otherwise i mean has both had conflicts with this civilizational world and so i don't think that you're going to uh successfully integrate that into a political coalition right because even even right even if you abandon christianity right it's not like they're not going to try and islamify you after some sort of win right or still through oh but even the worst case is that not even islamification but what happens is they secularize, they abandon their quote unquote shroud. And, and so really political, like politically politicized Islam, I hate to break it to people in Europe. It's been proven that it's not like a sustainable force in terms of base trad values, because what happens is the next generations, they secularize, but they still like, they have this weird hatred of the host population. A lot of and also, not also of them, again, what did we just what did we just talk about earlier? What is the hegemonic political narrative in the West? Yeah, is leftism, which yes. means they adopt leftism. Yes, so I mean a lot of and as someone mentioned earlier, it's very Marxist coded. It's very anti colonialist. Mm -hmm. And so again, you saw this in the in the pro Gaza protests in London. You can be on the right side of history or the white side of history. Like they will adopt the political framework of the host nation, i.e., leftism, to do what they want. And they get what they want. And they've yeah. been very successful at it. And they got to go. I, I disagree with the take. But yeah. Um, no, but also like all the violence and all the Like that. And not here's the it. thing. Not worth it. I know. Listen, for OPSEC, like, listen, not all Muslims are violent or whatever. I know we have to, we shouldn't be saying, you know, but not all of them are a problem. But in terms of a mass, like, uh, like in the tens of millions, I mean, it's just, it's, it's an insane take. It's, it's not. Even if they do secularize in a bit, like even if they do the total James Lindsay, they become like, you know, weirdo, uh, secular, progressive Muslims, like, you know, neoliberal hojabi Islam. That's even worse in some ways. That's, you know what I mean? Cause it's like, they're not based in trad anymore. They just, they still, you know, they still hate European people. It's just like, you know what I mean? Like, this is why people like James Lindsay, Pierre Bergosian, they're like, oh, but see, if they abandon their religion, they'll totally be Westerners. Like, that, that's fucking stupid. Like, that's well, that's the other back. side of the pro, you know what I, I mean? Like, that goes back to the um, yeah. uh, new atheist's fault. Yeah. It's, it's <clears throat> not really, like, again, the problem is that sometimes the enemy of your enemy is not really your friend. You know no. what I mean? You have to be pragmatic about these things. Yeah. And, you know, Europe has experienced so many problems within the span of 10 to 15 years that uh, it's just, I think, yeah, even people like, like, here's the thing. Okay. Here's the thing. As much as I, you know, respect a lot of some of his work, maybe not a lot, but some of his work, um, you have to realize that even people like Dugan do not have your interests as a North American or as a Western European at heart. That's just the reality. You know what I mean? People like that, they don't really, some of their ideas are brilliant. I've certainly read a bit of Dugan, but the whole like Eurasianist thing and it's just, I I mean, I was much more defensive years ago, but I, I just think that you have to think of these things more critically. And I think that a lot of the third sort of like courting this like third position thing I mean, not even really third position, but even just like the whole, you know, Eurasianist, uh, we have to align with other based people around the world. You have to think of these things. Like there are a lot of based people that probably are sympathetic, but they're probably not the ones immigrating to the West. <laughs> you know what I mean? So it's it's just, you have to think about these things with a clearer head. And I think you have to think of your interests and your, you know, and I think that um, you can take the good and you can take the bad with anybody. And, and I you think, and you should yeah. embrace and you should embrace sort of that discernment yes. and discrimination yes. to to look out for your own interest. Yeah. At the end of the day, 
you you've got to look out for yourself and your yes. people and that's yeah. not always going to mean that the guy wearing the turban or whatever on the other side of the road who's protesting something is going to have your best interest at heart remember yeah. you're you're not going to get saved by the political forces of the day and that allyship mm -hmm. is very dangerous well it's like people that are china files it's like china mm -hmm. like daddy z ping i'm sorry logo i'm sorry haas daddy z ping is not going to come and save you i'm sorry no daddy z ping is not going to get rid of western degeneracy quote unquote like um, that's not reality they have their own interests the chinese have clearly their own interests and they have in their rival civilization now, that's not to say that I, I'm racist against all Chinese people. That's not to say I hate all Islamic people or whatever. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that certain civilizations, they look out for themselves and they have their own interests. And you have to be cautious of the fact that if they hate your society, maybe it's not because they hate the same things you hate. Maybe they like to pretend. But, I mean, I don't... The Chinese is an even better example. Cause like mm -hmm. they, they, I mean, maybe some of them, like I, I've, I've read a bit of like America against America, but the one guy, what's his name? Um, you know, that Chinese scholar, uh, he wrote America against America. I know logo likes to cite that book, but a lot of people in the Chinese government, they don't give a fuck about Western right wingers. They don't care about like, you know what I mean? Like it's, 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 it's yeah. like, yeah, I, 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 I feel bad because I've certainly entertained a lot of this type of thinking and I, on an intellectual level, but over the years I've seriously started to reconsider my position when it comes to a lot of outside forces in, in the BRIC nations. Now people say, what about Russia, Geo? Here's the thing. Russia clearly has their own interests. I do think though, that there's an argument there to say that at least huge parts of Russia is been entangled in Western culture and basically is uh, another, like the Slavic world is part of, of Europe. Right. I think that's not, is that a controversial statement prude or uh, uh, to some extent? Well, I, okay. There, there's a hostility towards Europe, Western Europe, but I do think that um, there are a lot of parts of the Slavic world that are deeply embedded in European history, rightfully or wrongfully. I think Russia can be a little bit of an exception. Ukraine and Russia is an exception, of Geo, course. Geo, yeah. I don't mean to be that asshole. Right. It's 10 o'clock. I have a job tomorrow. There's still a dozen more Super Chats to go through. Sorry, Monochrome. sorry. I'm trying, to be, I'm trying to be... You've earned like, your $10 worth. Not to be No, but asshole. you know, I'm trying to be a, a wholesome Chinese fence hitter. I'm just saying like I'm yes, trying to think Yes, we know, but things. eventually the yeah. fence will break and a part of that's going to go up your ass. So you got to be careful. Um, oh, see, for doing a fat joke. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm just, that's a joke about fence sitting. Uh, New Glock, $5, says, are you guys familiar with keeping it real art critics? Thoughts? Gio, that's more of a question for you. Kirak, yeah, I'm familiar with Kirak. Yeah, I haven't watched all their videos, but I think they're pretty good. I think Kirak is all right. Um, all righty. Well, there well, you go. The whole thing with, uh, the whole thing with, um, with Hulebeck is quite, quite interesting, but, you know, Kirak is all right. Yeah. They're pretty good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> let's go on. Sorry. Uh, Seasider says, uh, I miss Louis Laval real bad. Whatever he's doing, I hope he's happy. I I hope so as well. I do I do mm. miss the past Louis rants. I really do miss them. Oh, yeah. Uh, plus, he had good video game commentary. Uh, Internet friend for $2 Canadian is forcing me to say the words goon widow. Well, there you go. I appreciate uh, $2 <laughs> Canadian. Widow. Hate what a term. term, goon widow. <laughs> Hate it. Uh, Belair. Uh, <clears throat> God bless. Uh, Belair, uh, Bolero 393 for $10 says, here's some money, bros. Rufo, Rufo is an edgier, straighter version of Douglas Murray. Mm. Yelling stop at the leftist stone as it rolls over them. Mm. Uh, to some extent. Certainly more effective than Douglas Murray. I would give I will oh, give yeah. Chris Rufo that much credit. More effective, to say the least. Um, back to uh, entropy real quick. <clears throat> uh, scribe you want me to read Prude? No, I got it. Scribe um, says Prude and Geo landed the old Tugger Carlson prime time prime time slot. Let's go. Very true. Yeah, and he said, yeah it is the old. And he, yeah. 
And he sends it over here as well via YouTube. I appreciate it, Scribe. I Thank apologize you. for skipping over your you know, initially. I mentioned it very, at the beginning of the show, but um, mm -hmm. I appreciate it. Um, and then last but not least is our good friend Frederick, who had sent the very kind $50 earlier, I think. No, not Fred. No, wasn't him. That was Monster Chief. This is uh, Monster Chief. So this is Frederick, uh, 1483. Thank you for getting so listing other letter, other numbers that are also on the... Thank you for uh, saving us from that OPSEC disaster. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, but thank you for using other numbers that are on the ADL's hate list website. We appreciate that. Oh, 1483 uh, he, is also on the ADL hate well, list? Well, 83 is, I think, what they say, Hail Christ or whatever. Oh, so the ADL's oof. got a laundry list of hate symbols that shit I never heard of until someone pointed it I've out. I've never heard. No, I've <laughs> generally never heard of that. That's incredible. Wow. Yeah, I only know about it because someone was like, here's all, like someone did a thread like a year or two ago on like all the ADL hate symbols list and how rare they are, where they come from. But oh anyways. Oh God. He was very generous and he sent $50. $50? That's very kind of you, sir. Thank you, sir. Um, I, I genuinely appreciate it. Uh, Don Cascino asks uh, for 199 best possible Trump Secretary of State pick. That is a hell of a question, man. Uh, well, uh, me, but also, uh, realistically, I, I think that he would need to. I think he needs to work with someone in business. Um, honestly, like I think Trump's first Secretary of State pick wasn't actually bad. So, I mean, I think that's something important to consider. Um, he Peter, had Peter Thiel. No, <laughs> oh, no, no. Heavens, no. Um, I, I think that Trump's uh, one of his first choices was not, um, you know, not awful um, when it came to respects to the, the State Department. And that when it came to that, I mean, I thought I mean, honestly, like Robert Lighthizer probably wouldn't be the best secretary of state. He should go back to maybe trade. Um he had uh, Rex Tillerson was not a bad secretary of state for all things considered. Uh, I think that he wants to have someone like that. Mm. So I, I don't have names and I had to do some research and I don't know if he's named anybody in potential, but I, I think that at the beginning of his cabinet, um, that he had some half decent picks, mm. but again, uh, we'd have to, We'd have to take a look at what else is out there. I think someone in the international business world would be good again. Obviously, he needs to have somebody that is very, very firm on immigration. But again, uh, Secretary of State needs to be someone who can handle the shit show in the Middle East, the shit show in Ukraine, and someone, and who, Asia. And someone who can listen to um, the, the concerns on China. Uh, I, I would not, for instance, I don't think that... Um, Elbridge Colby should be Secretary of State. Elbridge Colby needs another job in the Trump administration, like he had. Um, you, you need someone that is going to be able to handle three hot zones at once. And yeah. potentially, and potentially, actually, there's, there are five hot zones that America needs to be concerned about. Um, South America, specifically increased Chinese investment and increased Chinese intelligence relationships there. This also includes Canada in this, this mix, sorry, Geo. Mm -hmm. um, secondly, you have to handle how the hell are you going to defuse the war in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. um, the Middle East... This is not going away anytime soon. It will be an election issue this year um, for China. And then five is going to be um, uh, trade. And so whoever whoever can handle those five issues and work very closely with the trade representative, you're going to do great. Um, if you want a sixth international relations topic, it actually is going to matter. It will be the Arctic. Um, the Arctic Council is going to be only increasingly mm. more important as polar ice melts. Um, I'm not because it's, you know, whatever reasons for, I mean, climate, climate is changing. Let's not get ourselves, mm. but like the Russians are winning the icebreaker conflict and Russia is still a geopolitical adversary to the United States. So mm. you, mm. you need a, you need a Jack of all trades kind of guy, but I think Vince uh, McMahon, probably he's not doing anything. <laughs> no, yeah. So I mean, maybe, maybe Vince McMahon Daniel can Mc handle all that. Adams is my top pick. Um, Daniel McAdams. Um, are we saying this is like, uh, are we, are we, do we mean like the, um, there are a few Daniel McAdams is out there in the world. So you're going to have to tell me which one you're thinking of, hmm. unless you mean, um, <laughs> Dana, Dana white for secretary of state. <laughs> there you go. Unless you mean like the former, uh, war journalist and Ron Paul guy, that would be Maybe interesting. Him, yeah. 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 
Dana White for Secretary of State. Oh, there you go. Vince McMahon for Secretary of State. Yeah, okay, Ron Paul Institute, Daniel McAdams. That would be interesting. I mean, because mm. that's the closest guy I can think of that would embody that Justin Romando anthemism. Outside and of that, they also don't... don't like the Chinese as well. And they also don't like the Ch Chinese. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, but again, no, Eric Prince uh, would be Secretary of Defense. What are you talking about? <laughs> I don't think Eric Prince wants to give up what he's doing. And I don't know what would happen if he were to go yeah. and do and like come back to America and deal with some shit. I don't know if that would end well. That wouldn't probably, yeah, that probably wouldn't end well <laughs> for him. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, so uh, I will have a subscriber um, a article for you all tomorrow on Substack. Uh, and then next we'll have the digital archipelago on geo's channel. So that'll also be the same, um, day that my video with, uh, Jeremy Carl on his new book, the unprotected class, how anti-white racism is tearing apart America. Uh, that'll be premiering on next Tuesday in the morning. So by all means, be sure to tune into that. And then um, I have a few more essays in the works until I figure out my streaming schedule. This works for me right now. Um, we'll see how videos go in the future. Hopefully my voice will recover in the coming weeks and I can record actual video essays. But um, Gio, what do you have in the works? Well, I, I have to get on some reviews. And again, if you want to send me a movie review within reason, uh, you know, you know my fee, you know my PayPal. Tell me what it is. But I have to review uh, Fantastic Planet. I'm getting through this book that uh, John Carter wanted me to review. Then I have that Envy Desire one. And I think, uh, yeah. And so I'm also busy editing the book. But hopefully next week, if it's uh, content-minded, hope I'm aiming for a review by the end of the week being done this week. But next week, it will probably be a solo episode. And then probably the week after that will be the episode with Mr. D. But I do have other guests lined up. I would, I do want to go back to interviewing people. It's just that the beginning of this week has been quite busy. So, yeah. Well, all right. this is our new schedule. I think it worked out pretty well for us, um, mm -hmm. all things considered. We may not do three-hour-plus streams in the future. We'll see how it goes. Well, who um, knows? Maybe we could stream twice a week, Prude. That could be interesting. Well, I say I only say this, Geo, because I told you this before we went live in the air. I got up at four o'clock in the morning to go to some city several hours away from me to go to training. So I'm I'm dog tired. Um, I'm know, frog man. tired. So yeah, um, we'll uh, we'll be live next Tuesday on Geo's channel on the 23rd. Um, all of our links are down below in the description. Go to findmyfriends.net. Go to Patreon. Subscribe to all the great places. We will see you all next Tuesday. God bless yep. and take yep. care. God bless. Goodbye. Two. Sweet. See you, gents.